Capitola. First, I'm going to read uh, this meeting is being cable cast live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99, and is being recorded to be replayed on the following Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed from the city's website at www.cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Kingston. And as a reminder, if you would just please turn your cell phones to vibrate and um, or to silence, we appreciate it. And if you come to speak tonight, if when you come to the podium, we just ask that you sign in this sheet so we have your name for our records. With that, I'm going to ask for a roll call. Commissioner Ruth. Here. Commissioner Newman. Here. Commissioner Christensen. Commissioner Wilk. Here. Chair Welch. Here. And we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance now. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to uh, oral communications. Uh, we'll start off with additions and deletions to the agenda. Thank you. We've had a couple additions and uh, additions to the agenda. There was additional public comment for um, emailed to you this late this afternoon regarding uh, 115 San Jose, so items 5C and 5D. There was also an additional public email today sent for um, item 5B, 3744 Capitola Road, the sign application, and uh, 5E for 523 Burlingame Avenue. Okay, great. Did everyone get a chance to look at those? I apologize, I sent mine in late, so. No, okay. Um, after that, I guess now we'll move on to public comments, and the public comment section now is for items that are not on tonight's agenda. So if there's someone in uh, the public tonight that would like to speak to the Planning Commission about an item not on the agenda, this is your opportunity to come forward. And I don't see anyone moving, so we'll move on past that. We'll go back, we'll go down to commission comments. Do we have any commission comments? Um, we did get an item um, from the city regarding the social media. Yes, and yes. So um, there, one of the projects was posted on social media on the Nextdoor application on the platform. And the city at this time does not have a policy for this. And as we're um, at, at this point, I'd like to suggest that the city, we have an internal policy for staff. We do not have a policy for boards and commissions. So we'd like to take the opportunity to draft a policy and put that together in the coming month. We'll take that to city council for review and ask at this juncture that the planning commission not um, agree to not post projects on the platforms until we have such a, a process in place. Okay, and social media is a great tool to use out there, but understanding what uh, the process to go through until we get a policy, maybe we just have a consensus amongst us that We'll, we'll refrain from using it for gathering public input. Is that something we can all well, agree to? That's fine, but oh. I, I okay. think you need to hear from Katie on what the city attorney said, what his uh, interpretation was. Okay. I sure. So the city attorney in this in this instance of publishing on Nextdoor said that the posting was, um, we've handled it correctly, the posting did not show any bias towards the application. It, um, it, it was open because it was on next door and open to any Capitola residents. Any Capitola residents that are on the platform were, are able to make comment. And because those comments were shared to the planning commissioners within two separate emails um, and then the post was closed, um, up to the, the last comments that were made. So the Planning Commission has seen all of the right. posts that were made and it was submitted actually as, it's similar to an ex parte communication. So other commissioners that received emails regarding other projects, they tip, you would forward them on to me and I distribute or you can forward it to the Planning Commissions for dis distribution. So because this has been distrib distributed to all Planning Commissioners and everyone has the same information, um, 
it has followed the public process. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think that's fine. Go ahead. So um, I think it's great to explore what other jurisdictions are doing with this and come up with some kind of policy, but I, I, didn't, I wasn't clear from what you said whether it was going to come back for input from the Planning Commission before it went to City Council. If you would like that, I'm happy I to think, bring it back at I the mean, next meeting. I mean, we're the meeting. ones that are on the firing line here, so I think mm -hmm. that the City Council could possibly benefit from our input on that issue. Great. I'll plan. If we have it, we should have it drafted by the next meeting, so I'll bring it back okay. during that meeting. So, yeah, and, and, and there is no, um, uh, you know, ill will towards any of this that I, I see. I think the uh, option to use social media has a process, but I was just going to ask until we do have a process that maybe we just agree that we'll refrain until we get that process yeah, in that's place. That's fine. I hope a policy, though, would at least reflect that we are in the 21st century in the age sure. of technology. Right. That's why we should see what, yeah. I mean, I'm sure we're not the, the first one to run across this issue. No doubt. Great. Uh, any other commissioner comments? Fine with that as well. Okay. Uh, now we're to staff comments. Uh, no comments this evening. Okay. With that, we're going to move into a, a presentation uh, regarding the new mall. And so, um, this presentation really is just that. It's a presentation. We're not taking action on this tonight. And uh, I'm assuming some of you are here to see what is going to go on in the mall. So with that, we have uh, Stephen Logan. He's the, uh, with uh, Merlon Geyer. He's the Vice President of Development. And he's going to give us a presentation. And we'll have some discussion after that. And I'm going to I'm going to kick it off actually. Okay, so I'm going to take a step back and talk about what the Planning Commission and City Council and the City of Capitola residents have done since 2011 on this project. So in 2011 during the general plan update, there were stakeholder meetings uh, focused on 41st Avenue and the Capitola Mall and the outcome of those stakeholder meetings and I think there were three different concepts that were reviewed during those meetings um, is the Capitola Mall Revisioning Plan, which is available on our website. Um, following that effort, a lot of the, it, it really looked back and understood what was going on in the, in the area and put together um, uh, the starting point for the general plan on the 41st Avenue, so for that area. So in 2014, the general plan was adopted. Within the general plan, there are numerous goals and policies uh, geared towards the Capitola Mall. I'm going to highlight a few of them. First is to support the long-term transfer, um, transformation of the Capitola Mall into more pedestrian-friendly commercial district with high-quality architecture, outdoor amenities, attractive to shoppers and families. And within that policies for the parking lot redevelopment, um, suggesting that commercial and mixed-use structures would be appropriate within the parking lots of the Capitola Mall. Again, words about enhanced design and character. Next, public gathering spaces. Uh, talk about encouraging outdoor dining and courtyards, spaces for people to meet. New interior streets. Uh, the description says new interior streets within the mall property lined with sidewalk-oriented retail, outdoor dining, pedestrian amenities. <coughs> Um, and then the next goal of land use goal nine, to encourage high quality development within 41st Avenue corridor that creates an active and inviting public realm. And that's what we're hearing for the future of retail. If you make it active and inviting, people will come out and shop. So um, again, po a policy for public amenities to enhance the vitality of the corridor. So having outdoor dining, courtyards, public art, publicly accessible semi-public gathering spaces, bicycles, pedestrian friendly. Um, also a focus on entertainment uses. So bringing in new entertainment and commercial recreational uses into the area. And one last goal is for economic development. So provide businesses and jobs that create a healthy and sta stable local economy. Um, so again, looking at this as a regional center with local retail, a mix of local and, re and regional um, retail, entertainment, and becoming a dining destination. So after adoption of the general plan in 2014, your implementation plan is your zoning code. So in 2018, the city, um, the city worked from the time the general plan was adopted, and we continue to work on our update to the zoning code. But in the 2018 zoning code, we really took that language that was in our general plan and, and 
created an avenue for in which to incentivize um, redevelopment of the mall. So chapter 17.88 is incentives for community benefits. And I always think of this chapter as the give and the gets. So within the, within the regional commercial zone, there's a 40 foot height limit and a floor area ratio of 1.5. In, under this specific chapter, if the mall, there's um, a list of gives that a developer can provide, but specific to the mall, the gives were listed as a, a mall block pattern, surface parking lot redevelopment, transit center, and affordable housing. In addition to that, there's open space, public art, and the list goes on. In return, the developer would get an increased floor area ratio of two and a building height of Five, 50 feet, so it's um, an extra 10 feet, so an extra floor. So with that, I think uh, Capitola, through its general plan and its zoning code update, it has been anticipating mall redevelopment and looking forward to it. And with that, we have uh, Stephen Logan, the Vice President of Development for Merlone Geyer, and I welcome you, Stephen. Thank you. <coughs> Chair, Commissioners, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. and. <clears throat> we know that this mall has been there for a long time and and we're very proud to present to you finding you know we're talking about what Merlon Geyer is about first we want to show you about you know a couple projects that we are currently um, constructing and developing we want to talk about the purchase of the mall our community um, um, survey and, and meetings that we've had and then obviously our new acquisition of the Sears parcel and go through some of our community um, survey results and then open it up for questions you know we're not showing any plans tonight we don't um for community we're going to have a community meeting here um uh, june 11th so with that i just start off and you know Mer Mer merlon geyer has uh been around for 24 years we're a private equity firm we <clears throat> we raise our money through endowments through uh yale and stanford and some of the largest uh, school endowments through through, through the country We've currently raised over four and a half billion dollars over the last 24 years. We're currently in our 12th fund. Um, we're a fully integrated firm. We do all of our own property management, development, construction, um, asset management, leasing, all, all in-house. We own, you know, our, our strategy is buying grocery anchored shopping centers and regional malls um, up and down the West Coast from San Diego all the way up to Seattle. Uh, basically take the I-5 corridor all the way up, up the coast and that's pretty much our bread and butter. And so with that, I want to talk about a couple of developments. So this is an old Macy's that was in North Hollywood. Uh, it was, it's called Laurel, Laurel Plaza. There was a mall that was attached to this. And in 1993, the mall was basically destroyed as part of the Northridge earthquake. Macy's owned this, it was a 25 acre site. And so we bought this from, from Macy's back in 2014 and are currently under construction. Basically, what you can see is uh, we took the Macy's building and we cut windows in it. We're going to make about 235,000 square feet of office. We're putting in a roughly 320,000 feet of retail. And we're, uh, we just sold the residential, seven and a half acres of 642 units. And so this is the site plan. The residential is in the yellow in about seven and a half acres. And then the retail and the parking is, is, is next to the 170 freeway in Hollywood. And this is a rendering of what that potential will look like. We're currently under construction today. This project will open uh, to the public in April of 2020. Uh, to the left, you can see where it says Creative Forest. That is the office building in which you just saw the old Macy's building, no windows, total barricade, cutting in windows, making a creative office. And we're bringing in grocery stores, you know, fashion, quick service restaurants, local restaurants, and national restaurants. And this just goes to show you of the type of quality of, of, of development that, that we you know, tend to bring here to Capitola. Next is, this is in Mountain View, which is over the hill. I was told today that's what, how, how you call it here. Um, so this, is, this was an old Sears site that we uh, purchased back in 2011. It was about 10 acres. We took this site and basically um, built some retail and 330 apartments. And so here's a site plan to the right shows the apartments and the, the retail and to the left, you can see we built office. This was roughly 450,000 square feet. It was, it was originally leased to LinkedIn. 
and the LinkedIn bought, was bought up by Microsoft and it's currently occupied by Facebook. So this, so this is actually built, it's, it's open, it was, it's been open um, for a couple of years. This is pictures of, of, of a park and it shows how retail can uh, be mixed in with residential above it. And so this is another uh, picture of, of the apartments above retail and how, how it shows pedestrian friendly access, walkability, you know, parking and, and outdoor space, which I think is very, very key here for, for our future at uh, Capitola. So just wanted to go through a project background. You know, we purchased the mall from Mace Rich back in April of 2016. And, you know, the original ownership, we have about 21 acres. We basically had the heart of the mall. There's, there's multiple owners on this, and we'll walk through that in a second. The entire property is roughly 46 acres, and so we owned about 45% of it. Um, and through this, you know, anchors, Target, Macy's, and Sears have site plan control. And through, so the light blue area shows what we purchased and what we owned. The yellow obviously was Sears, Target's in the pink, Macy's is in the blue, Olive Garden up to the upper right, the Ross Parcel, Citibank, Bank of America, so you can see what the challenge was when we first purchased this property of what to do with it. Because the way that these uh, regional shopping centers work is every time you want to change something or want to do something, you have to go ask for permission from Sears, Macy's, and Target. And there's an underlying document that allows you to do certain things that you can develop, certain uses that you can use. And so when we went out to the community, we w this is what we were working with. and so. We wanted to reach out to the community and see what their thought process was on us just to redevelop the mall. So in January of last year, I said it says 19, but it actually is 18, so that's a mistake on my part. But <clears throat> we went out to the community and we, and we held a forum in, in which about 120 people showed up. And we, 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 we basically showed what we were going to do to the interior of the mall and people were pretty much underwhelmed because they're like, hey, you're just going to redo the mall and great, we're going to have an interior mall and you're not going to push retail to the street and you're not going to bring in restaurants and you're not going to be pedestrian friendly and bike friendly and wh what are you going to do? And and it was really underwhelming in, in, in their mind. Although the architecture was great, it was just un underwhelming. And we, we heard that people, why don't you just redevelop the whole site? And so we had to explain to everybody about the site plan control. And, and we have been talking to all, all of the anchors. We've talked to Sears, we've talked to Target, and we've talked to Macy's on an ongoing basis. They're very well aware of, of that. And so what we heard too is we want retail to the street, we want local and national restaurants, we want some housing, we want relevant retail. There's not relevant re retail there today, it's just average retail and we want some place that we can shop, that we can go hang out, get a cup of coffee, grab a glass of wine, and be able to be someplace for some, some period of time. And so with that, we went out to the community for a survey. And so we'll walk through some of those, those <coughs> uh, survey comments here in a second. So then in our ongoing discussions with Sears, we've, we've purchased roughly around 10 Sears over our last 20 years. And so we've been having an ongoing conversation with Sears and Saratage about their site. Even right when we bought them all, we, we, we asked if they were interested in, in letting go of Sears. And so finally in December of, Last year, we finally got that piece taken care of. And so with the, with the Sears purchase, it added 10 acres to the mall. So now the mall is 31 acres, and now we own 67% of the mall. It doesn't mean now that we own the majority of the mall that we can do anything we want. We still have site plan controls with Target and Sears, and we're currently under negotiation with them on, on a bunch of things, but talking to them about potentially what, what could happen at, at, at Capitola. So this now shows how much more site control we have. We now obviously now have some frontage around um, Capitola Road. We have frontage around 41st Avenue. And going from there, Cole's on this, they're a lease. So they have a long-term lease with us. We have talked to them about their viability. They really love this location and, and they're gonna be here for a long term. So with this, we now can finally unlock pieces of the puzzle and now hopefully take some feedback from the community survey and now we go together and start imp implementing a plan. So we, we created a mall survey called Create Tomorrow Together. And what this was is basically we reached out to the community about a, a 10 mile radius, got a bunch of feedback, 30,000 people we sent um, 
cards out to to get a feedback online survey. There were 12 questions. And so with that, we received 7,700 responses from, from the surrounding residences about the mall. 35 of them, 3,500 of them shared their contact information. So now we can update them on an ongoing basis of what's happening, you know, with, <clears throat> you know, on a monthly basis and events and, and eventually, you know, the redevelopment of the site. You know, what we, what we saw here is that people wanted world-class retail brands distinguished local restaurants and national restaurants, increased options for women apparel, and a new luxury cinema. And so with that, we're gonna go through just, I, I highlighted a few items off the survey. I didn't wanna go through the whole survey. We'd, we'd be here until tomorrow. So what we did is we first asked, do you go to the mall? 97% of the people said yes. 54% of them go there often, um, probably about um, once a month or so and sometimes four to five times uh, in, in that month. You know, what kind of products or services do you usually purchase when you're at the mall? Clothing and shoes, accessories, everyday household and skincare products. And so as you can see, clothing and shoes and accessories is 80% of, of the survey. What's important to you? Like I said, world-class retail brands, ambiance, and, and, and a town center type of, type of area. Where can we go sit and have a glass of wine or a coffee? Where can I take? go take my kids and run around in seating areas and, and, and meet people and have fun. Distinguished restaurants, local and national mix of restaurants, entertainment or recreation. And we'll get into the entertainment here in a second. And what would you like to have included at the Renewed Mall? Women's apparel, as you can see, women's apparel has been very apparent in all of these um, moving forward. Home decor and improvement and boutique stores. And so with this, we kind of get a sense of what type of retailers we want to go out and talk to, who's out in the marketplace, who wants to be in Capitola and, and, and in the area. And, and so we've started some of those uh, initial thoughts on, on talking to those retailers. We're actually meeting with a lot of retailers uh, later on this month in ICSC in, in Vegas, which is the annual retail convention. So we will sit down and talk to them about, hey, if we had a plan, what kind of plan would you like to see and would you want to be here in Capitola on a long term? So what kind of dining would you like to see? Local and national restaurants, 65%. Healthy dining, casual full service dining. So it's not, it's not all sit down, you know, white tablecloth dining, but there's also some very casual dining um, as well. So what kind of entertainment or recreation do you wanna see? 63% wanna see a, a movie theater. People wanna see outdoor gathering places and live entertainment. You know, does that mean you know, during the summertime, you bring in bands and have a jazz, th have, you know, jazz concerts or movies and movies for the kids or, you know, we're, we're gonna, now we have to take all of these ideas and figure out what, what our next steps are. So the takeaways we get from this on the uses is obviously clothing, shoes and apparel for women and men, um, boutique retailers, beauty and skin products, home decor improvement, key local national restaurants, luxury movie theater and entertainment. And we plan to bring every single one of those to this uh, mall. And so that's, that's a very key for us, knowing that, hey, this is what the community wants to see and it's very, it's very evident that, that they're lacking things within their community without having to go over the hill to go <coughs> get these services. Other takeaways on the site planning is ambiance and town center and retail to the street, housing, fitness, grocery and walkability. So we've, you know, we'll take all of that in, into consideration when we look at, you know, studying the site plan and, and what we're gonna come up with. But, you know, it, it was 7,700 people taking a survey. We've done this in other communities and we roughly get between three and 4,000 people responding to that, so almost double. It's, it's pr pretty evident to us that people are really focused on what they want here. So, you know, we have a one-time shot to, to do something right. So we wanna do something right here on a long-term basis and, you know, our next steps, we're gonna to present to city council next week and talk about all of some of these same ideas that came up. We're having a community meeting on uh, June 11th located at the Sears building. You know, we'll continue to meet further with key stakeholders in the community and get feedback from them. And then our goal is to prepare an application and, and, and put, in a, put in a plan sometime in Q3 of, of 2019. And we know it's gonna take some time. There's a lot of work to be done and, and you know, working with staff and and getting, getting to an end game, I think, is what we all want to want to get to at the end. That's something for all the community. And just because we have one more community meeting doesn't mean it's going to be our only community meeting. I think we're going to, it's going to be a process to be out in the community, talking to people individually, having coffee 
or even in a group setting. And, and sometimes people feel they can share more as an individual instead of in a group setting. So we're going to be open to that. We'll be up here. We'll be talking to people moving forward. So um, with that, that's uh, wanted to share that with you tonight. And I appreciate you letting me be here to, to speak. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, any questions from the group? I have some. Do you have a budget of what you kind of contemplate spending up there? Well, we always have a budget, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, we haven't we haven't formally put together a budget, but I mean, we have an idea of what we want to spend and what the, what costs are and what what we can what we can get out of it. Yeah, one thing, and I'm probably one of the earliest baby boomers, uh, born in '44. Actually, I'm just outside the window. And, you know, our days are numbered, and the shopping patterns of the next generations are definitely changing. So, our, how how do you plan to address that? Well, I think, you know, retail is changing, but retail is not dead. So let's understand that, you know, just because retail is changing, you have to change with it. And that brings, you know, maybe there's some streetscape and walkability and places and, and the right places to be and, and the right restaurants that want to be here and, and just continuing to talk to people out in the community about that. And, it's, and it, you just have to make it relevant retail. And you have to bring, you know, the shopping centers are evolving in which they have more entertainment uses. They have more fitness uses and, and, the, and just the right type of retail. And, and retail is not dead, it's just changing, constantly changing. One of the things I read was uh, some malls are considering uh, bringing in healthcare facilities into the mall. We, we would not do that. We don't see that's, a, that's an option here. And we did show you a couple of office. We don't plan on office here. It's not an office market in our mind. I know the two plans we showed you had a significant amount of, of office, but office and medical office are not today not contemplated in our in our. Well, they're not good for us either. They don't generate <laughs> sales tax revenue. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is that good? Okay. So, um, where I think our general plan uh, is currently maybe a bit deficient as far as the mall, now that it's five years old, and I was the um, chairman of the general plan advisory committee over a three-year period and follow that process very closely. But what I think we failed to do looking back now was emphasize the need for housing and mixed use enough at that site because what's happened over a period of time is that the critical need for housing has just gotten greater and greater. And so your Mountain View project, I didn't hear enough from you really about the potential for mixed use and housing on this site similar to the, to the uh, photos you gave us of Mountain View, what you did there. Uh, we, we do plan on plan on a housing component. I think on, that on needs site. to be really emphasized uh, for a number of reasons, and uh, you know I, I hope that will be part of the plan. As as part of our survey, you know we had about twelve questions, and housing was was in there, and and we did get a number of responses of people saying that housing is needed on site. So, you know the amount of housing, what type of housing, that's that's all needs needs to be considered. Good, Courtney. Peter, you guys have any well, uh, You probably already know this. this is probably a stupid question, but as you're going through that presentation, I know you're talking about movie theaters and mixed-use restaurants, and I was just thinking of the new movie theater that we just put in that's across the street from you and the Olive Garden and the new, various new restaurants that are there. I, I'm assuming you're full aware, fully aware of your surrounding businesses and competition and what... Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I can say a stupid question, but it just struck me that you were yeah, we, we, talking we, about we, things that had already just been resolved in other locations. That's all. Do you have any questions or comments? I don't, none at the time, no. Um, well, I, Stephen, thanks for coming, and I appreciate you uh, being honest and forthright about the underwhelming uh, or the consensus of the the first meeting, and I, I understand in the constraints of uh, the amount of property you actually owned, I, I see that. And um, I, I concur with Commissioner Newman about uh, this housing. And it's um, something that every city, in it, and especially now Newsom is pushing, uh, you know, this housing and uh, demand for housing. Uh, you know, the state impacts us through, you know, the arena numbers, the amount of numbers in housing we're supposed to have. So. Um, you know, I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with as far as having that housing and, and making this something that's going to be, um, you know, useful to the whole community. And, and 
I guess I should say I'm not surprised to see the response that you said you had those 7,000 or so people that uh, gave input because it's a it's a big part of not just Capitola but our whole community and and um, you know it's it's been tough uh, well for me for one as a planning commissioner watching those stores set empty uh, and the city losing revenue and and people being discouraged about a prime piece of property so I look forward to uh, seeing what you guys come up with and um, I, I will say, and I'll bring it up again at the end of the meeting, that at 6 o'clock in the evening at the Sears building on June 11th, they're going to have this community forums. Um, and at that point, I guess you'll have more of a question-answer period. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably, you know, show some con conceptual plan. It's going to be more of a open house type of forum. It's, we'll probably high-level talk about, maybe go through a little bit what we went to tonight, but um, it, it's going to be a forum. We're going to probably potentially just you know have stations set up to talk to people and and it'll be an it'll be an open forum it's not going to be a presentation okay very to, good to that sense um <clears throat> anybody any other commissioners have comments no. uh this is really was designed to be a presentation tonight um how many is there people in the audience that came to see this specifically and have some specific input so, something they'd like to comment on before Stephen leaves Okay, well, seeing that, Stephen, I thank you very much. Staff, are you good? Any questions? We're or good. Comments? Yeah, um, I just, I'm glad you repeated that the meeting will be on June 11th at 6 p.m. and at the Sears building. So and we'll be uh, partnering up and making sure that the word gets out there to the public. Um, it's about a month away, so you'll start seeing information around town, and we'll highlight it on our web page. And great. Okay. And and we'll definitely notice it at least two weeks in advance in local newspapers, like we did last time. Great. And they're also available on the website. So if you have comments, should it go specifically to you or they can just... You can go to our website or you can... I left Katie some business cards if you wanted to pick those up and, and or you can go to the mall. I mean, or if you have a question, I guess email Katie and she can forward it to me and, and we can be in contact. So Okay. I should be open. clear that at this point, you know, the city does not have an application in, so there's no public comments really right. that we would take in from the public. But if, if anyone has concerns, I'm happy to connect you with Stephen. And... And on that, we should add that when it does start going to the application period, there'll be more time, opportunity for public comment as it comes to the Planning Commission, so and the City Council meeting. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Appreciate you coming. Okay. With that, we will move into uh, item four, approval of our minutes from March 7th and April 4th. And I think we need to break up this into two because I think we had absence. So uh, first on... Um, Approval for the meeting of March 7th. I'll move approval. Second. Yeah. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And someone was missing one of those meetings. That was that? That was oh. me. Okay. And then so for uh, our meeting of April 4th, I think that was a meeting you missed. So. I'll move approval. <laughs> I'll abstain on that one since I wasn't here for okay, I'll second. all the hearings. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. One uh, absten abstain. And I, I guess you maybe were here. So, and all those in favor? Aye. 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 And Courtney, was that clear? Enough? Or Chloe? I mean, was that? Oh my God, we always get this Courtney Chloe. They'll be fine. <laughs> I'll figure it out before uh, we're done here. Okay. okay. With that, we'll move into our public hearings, <laughs> and uh, our first item is item 5A, 1200 C 41st Avenue for a conditional use permit. Uh, Don, you? Thank you, Chair Welch, and uh, uh, good evening. Uh, Planning Commission Chair, uh, Commissioners. Uh, the application before you is a conditional use permit amendment for Sapporo Ramen to allow on-site beer and wine consumption. The restaurant is part of the Begonia Plaza located at 1200C 41st Avenue in the Community Commercial Zoning District. The site was previously occupied by Rui Dim Sum, which received a conditional use permit for a restaurant in 2015. The original permit did not include approval for the sale of alcohol. The current application is an amendment to the original CUP to continue as a restaurant and include the sale of alcohol. The applicant must have an approved conditional use permit from the city of Capitola before the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control will allow a Type 41 license to be used by, at 1200C 41st Avenue. Chief of Police Terry McManus has reviewed the application and provided a letter of necessity and convenience which is required by the ABC. Uh, 
Staff recommends the Planning Commission review the application and approve the amendment to the conditional use permit based on conditions and findings. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions, and I believe the applicant is in the audience. Okay. Any questions for staff? Uh, would the applicant like to speak? Not, it's not, not necessary, but if you'd like to speak, you can. Oh, okay. Come on up. Okay, you can you can just if you speak into the microphone and let us know your name. Yeah, uh, um, my name's uh, Daniel. Um, the owner's uncle. Okay. So I, I don't have anything to plan, so I so I just uh, um, so so uh, we we want to increase the the business with the alcohol use. Okay. Um, so to the local um, community, yeah, so. Okay, that's, Daniel, that's fine. Any questions for no. Rep, Daniel? Okay, thank you, sir. Are th yeah. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to, you're, you're good, thank you. You can, you can return to okay. your seat. Okay, thank, thank you. you, no questions for you. Any, anyone else like to speak on this? Okay, we'll bring it back to the commission for a discussion and vote. I have no comments on this one. No comments? Mm -hmm. I'll move approval. Okay, so we have a motion. Second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So it's approved. Thank you, Daniel. Good luck. <laughs> We're good to go. <laughs> he knows you. Yeah. That's, <laughs> if you can leave if you'd like, you don't have to stick around <laughs> for the rest of the meeting. You were approved. <laughs> <laughs> good luck. Okay, so we're going to move on to item B. This is for uh, 3744 Capitola Road for a sign permit. Thank you, Chair Welch. Uh, the application is a new sign, for a new wall sign for Pono Hawaiian Kitchen and Tap. The sign. So hold on. Uh, excuse me. I need to recuse myself due to uh, having a property interest within 500 feet. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Newman. Uh, I'll go ahead and. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and restart. Uh, the application is for a new wall sign for Pono Hawaiian Kitchen and Tap. The sign will be located at 3744 in the Community Commercial Zoning District. Staff would like to note that the property is outside the coastal zone and subject to new sign regulations under the new zoning code. <coughs> the maximum allowable area of a wall sign is one square foot sign area per linear foot of shop front with a not to exceed maximum of 36 square feet. The linear footage of the shop front is 38 feet, therefore the property is subject to the 36 square foot maximum. The proposed wall sign includes a logo and channel lettering. The logo measures 5 feet wide by 5 feet tall. The lettering measures 13 feet wide by 19 inches tall. The total sign area is 45 square feet. The applicant is requesting an adjustment to the maximum sign area to allow a 25% increase, which does equal 45 square feet. Under the new sign code, the Planning Commission may approve an adjustment to increase the permitted sign area of up to 25% if five findings shown on this slide can be made. Staff was not able to make findings in support of numbers three and five, which I'll go into on the next slides. Finding three, the adjustment is necessary due to the unique characteristics of subject property, structure, or use. On this property, the structure is close to the road and is visible from the street and sidewalk. Finding five, the adjustment will not establish an undesirable precedent. The project is outside the coastal area, therefore the new zone code applies. This is the first sign adjustment uh, request we've received under the new code. Allowing the adjustment when findings cannot all be made may establish an undesirable precedent. Because the findings cannot be made, staff included condition of approval one, which requires a reduction in size of the logo from five feet by five feet to four feet by four feet, which complies with the 36 square foot maximum. Currently, the site has several unpermitted signs. As a condition of approval, 
All signs on the property must be in compliance. This includes the removal of a temporary wall sign, the front window signs, and the abandoned monument sign from the previous tenant. The applicant may apply for an administrative sign permit for a window sign that does not exceed 30% of the window area. Staff recommends the Planning Commission deny the sign adjustment request and approve the sign application based on conditions and findings. That concludes the uh, presentation. If you have any questions for me. Any questions for staff? I do. Go ahead. So your recommendation um, to reduce the, the uh, logo to four by four, I'm not sure why you're so specific. If, if the requirement is really 36 square feet of wall signage, shouldn't your recommendation just be that the total signage be 36 square feet? In other words, leave it five by five and then maybe reduce the kitchen and tap? Yeah, that, that could be an option. And then also, um, you mentioned low voltage. Um, and I think the purpose of the uh, signage is you, is you want to make sure that it doesn't cause a glare for motorists and pedestrians. And the voltage may be a means of doing that, but I don't think you should specify how they get there, just that they get there. If they have a high voltage sign that is, is low illumination, that's fine. And what is low voltage? Two volts, 100 volts? Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that's an unnecessary um, complication. Okay. Is there a reason, a reason for the low voltage specifically? That was something that was included in the application, so we, we attached it to the conditions. Well, I'd hate to be the person who found out that my sign voltage was a volt over some magic <laughs> minimum. I don't know if, if we have any voltage may, counters out yeah. there, but. So that's condition of approval number two, and it says the wall sign may not expose any direct light or electrical. All electrical shall be concealed. The logo shall be internally illuminated. The channel lettering shall be illuminated from the back for halo glow. The sign illumination shall be low voltage and shall not shine directly on adjoining properties or cause glare for motorists and pedestrians. I think it would be easy to just cross out the below voltage and, yeah. because our, our code does speak to shall not shine directly on adjoining properties or cause glare to motorists and pedestrians. So that's an easy more sense to me. edit. Thank you. Okay, any other? Yeah, just to follow up on Peter's question, if the logo stayed at the five foot diameter, uh, what would be the reduction in the size of the sign lettering? Do we know that? If they reduce the channel lettering as opposed to the logo? No, if they kept the logo at the same size and reduced the size of the lettering, do, you know, do we know what that would have to be reduced to to meet the 36 square feet? Uh, it'd yeah, be a, 11, square. 11 square feet would be left for the sign mm -hmm. below because 36 minus 25 is 11. So I believe Commissioner Christensen was considering <laughs> I was that. playing with the logo and <laughs> when I received I think Troy's email um, he was saying that if they reduced the size of the of the circle they would see the unsightly vent, vent behind right, it right. Um, and so I started playing with it and it and if they shrunk the lettering about a foot and then took off six inches from the height it would fit within um, the 36 square foot allowance but I think I was discussing it with Katie and the overall length of the, um, the frontage of the building is 38 lineal feet and they could probably, I think they could cheat it up a little bit is what I think. It well, we have a max of, of 36. 36, right? Yeah. But I think the, the future code is, is going to the one foot per lineal foot of one yeah, square foot it's per either or yeah. the the old code was up uh, had no maximum this is on the new code okay. the new code has a maximum of 30 yeah. um, well maybe we could let the applicant is the applicant here and would like to speak well come on up looking forward to having a wine restaurant in the city limits of <laughs> oh, Capitol yeah. so has got a great reputation yeah uh, good evening chair uh, planning commissioners and staff uh, my name is Sean Adams I'm the owner of Monterey signs and Santa Cruz signs we were hired by Pono to uh, bring signage and breathe new life into this bamboo garden building that they've uh, leased. So um, 
We, uh, we spoke with city staff before we made the uh, uh, sign drawings and sign plans uh, to get on the same page. And um, the only discrepancy was uh, the diameter of that logo. And that is, a, it's covering up a four foot diameter attic vent that you saw in some of the photos. So the plan was to create the logo for Pono that was just slightly larger than the attic vent. So the vent could still operate and be functional, but it would hide it. You can see it there. It's just, it's unattractive. So uh, we wanted to cover it up with the logo element. And then um, we were hoping you could, you would find it that it wasn't excessive, that we hope you find <coughs> it would be attractive and well-balanced and uh, appropriate for, for the use. Um, the letters, the faces of the letters don't light up. They're a uh, soft halo lit glow on the backside. And uh, most municipalities, you know, really like that treatment of, of signage. It's a softer, uh, more elegant, uh, more sophisticated type of sign. So um, it's a very professional sign. And the existing window uh, graphics that are on there, that's really just meant to hide the construction equipment and tools that are on the inside. All that's going away when they're open for business, as well as the old sign that's there. We did consider a monument sign at the front of the business that would be perpendicular to the building. Uh, but it was, I, I think there was a setback requirement from the city for that type of sign. Uh, so this was really the next best alternative. Okay, any questions? No, the, just the diameter of the vent is then four feet, you said? Four feet, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we could make it, you know, we could make it four and a half feet for the sign, but you know, it. This is the subjective nature of, I think, the meeting tonight for this. Would it, would it be acceptable to shrink the kitchen and tap a, a scooch? Yeah, if, <laughs> if, you, if you need that to be. I mean, because yeah. it would fit under the, you can leave the circle alone if you just shrink the lettering. It'll fit within the 36 square feet yeah. allowance. We, we could do that. I'm here to ask for this. Yeah. But if that's <laughs> what you would like us to do, we can do that. Thank you. Peter, do you have any questions? Um, I guess a, I guess not a, a not okay. First. You can thank you very much. Okay. I think we got thank enough you. information. We can all right discuss it now. Are there any anyone else in the public that has comments on this? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the commission for discussion. And you know, there's there's one other combination too is to reduce the logo to the size of the vent, right? And reduce the lettering just slightly. So there there's several combinations here. I would I would. Uh, like to give him the option of, of bring it into conformance to the ordinance, but reducing whatever he right. feels is best reduced to achieve what he wants to achieve. So I have a question of, about the ordinance. This is uh, actually kind of a carryover, the, the maximum 36 square feet. Um, you guys have been around a little longer than I have. Is there, what, what's the history of having that maximum? Signs are a big thing in Capitola, and, and there's a lot of work and effort that went into that, and um, mostly probably consensus over the period of time to, to get it so that you don't have these overwhelming signs. When we were rewriting the new code, and Nick, I don't remember, were you here initially when we started? Mm, I don't right believe so, but signs, so, have, signs have been debated in this community yeah. for the last <coughs> 40 or 50 years. <laughs> I. I think you guys are on the right track and maybe someone could look at a motion maybe of letting staff work with the applicant to, I mean, I think you understand, we understand where we're trying to get. We, we, it's hard for us to make an exception um, necessarily to the, uh, based on the information we have. So. And if you'd like, I can clarify a little bit about the history. Oh, good. Of the, good. So the, the old code was one um, square foot per linear foot of building and there was no max. And under the old code, all wall signs came to planning commission. With the new code, it's, you know, there's the maximum that's been uh, put in, but if you wanna go beyond the max, so now it's an administrative process. If you stay under, if you stay at one uh, square foot per linear foot of building. We could have, if this came in at 36 square feet, approve this administratively at a staff level. And the Planning Commission put maximum levels, and then if you want to go beyond that, you have to come 
to the Planning Commission to ask for that increased area. So under the fifth finding for whether or not you're setting precedence, you know, under the old code, this could have come to Planning Commission up to 38 square feet, whereas today it comes to 36 square foot max because that's what's allowable administratively. So a little more history on and that. And so we, when, we, when we wrote this, this is not a variance per se, right? No, and we wanted to move away from the variance and create adjustments because it's often hard to make variance findings for signs, but sometimes there's really practical reasons right. regarding site being able to see. And the notion of covering up this vent is not, uh, it couldn't be stretched as a, as a exception or a, a special cause for needing extra signage. Um, it could be possibly a unique characteristics of the structure, if that's what. Right, it's Just reaching to see if there's any reason why we should grant a variance, and the only thing that that's unusual about this property is the vent. Well, it's not really a variance. This is at our discretion. So this is separate from the variance track. This is at our discretion to allow that. Um, well, but I agree with you that you know there's a, they spent a lot of time working on the zoning right. code. And you, you just, we, I don't think it's appropriate for us to casually ign ignore it or, or, or override it. Uh, and so I was just wondering if, you know, if there were, were there any special reasons why we should that, that are kind of unusual? And I would think that would be the only straw we could, would grasp at if we wanted to make an exception. Um, for me, I would be comfortable if we they would just reduce it to the size of the vent. And I, I should have asked. I get, you're not actually covering the vent. You're hiding the vent, but you're not covering. The vent's there for a purpose, right? So, right, so remove it's out. Right, yeah. So I, I, personally, I could live with reducing it to the size of the vent. Um, no one's interested in revisiting the, uh, the code itself. <laughs> no, we're not interested in opening that up. I think you could go up to 38 feet without saying that you've set a new precedence because of the at the one linear foot, you know, because he's come to the planning commission to ask for an adjustment. Um, typically, you would be allowed one square foot per linear foot. And that's why you would come before the planning commission to ask to go beyond the right. 36 square feet. And at that point, you're not asking for more than others have achieved without a variance in the past. But that's so, also so that's a middle precedent. ground at 38. It's not too much more of a precedent, I think, if, if, if it's part of the old code, it seems. But we changed the code for a reason. So <laughs> right. we're going to go back to the old code. Why did we change it? But, but really, it's the difference between what can be approved administratively at the 36 feet and then coming in to the Planning Commission for a request um, to go beyond. So it, it right. I and don't that, know. That was a big part of our the rewriting our code was trying to put a lot of the work more towards staff so it didn't have to come to the Planning Commission. So, um, but we did leave that opportunity if they want to go above what the code was that they could come to the Planning Commission for approval. So do we have any? I'd like to try a motion. There you go. I thought would be good. I would move that the applicant be directed to conform to the 36 square feet, but given the option to make the necessary adjustments to either the logo or lettering size, however he feels comfortable with. OK. So we have a motion. Is there a second to support that? I'll second it. OK. Do we have any discussion about that? Is everyone? No discussion, no questions? Do you have questions, Courtney? Can I, um, can I, you can, uh, can I, um, like a, uh, you can ask for a friendly amendment. If amendment? <laughs> <laughs> can, I admit, can I, can I make it 38 to conform to old code? I don't know how friendly that is. You know, I just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just look at all the work that was put into developing these ordinances and the sign ordinance and I just think it's important that we hold to them. You could make a subsequent motion. Can I make a subsequent motion? <laughs> well, I guess we would have to take, we'd have to see if this vote passes okay. and okay. then, um, so like with that, I guess we'll do a roll call vote then. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Christensen? No. <laughs> Commissioner Wilk? Aye. 
Chair Welch. Aye. Okay, so motion passes to one. Is that right? Three one. Three, Three one. one. <laughs> For math, math's sake. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thank you, sir. Do you, are you clear on where we stand on that? What would you say? Yeah, and however you work that out. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I ask you to, uh, would it be possible to see how many people in the audience are here on Burlingame and how many oh. are here on San Jose? Because if they're yeah. all here on Burlingame, I would ask that we take that one first. We, that's a good proposal. So can I ask how many people are here for San Jose? We got a few. How many people for the Burlingame? Yeah, we got about the same, really. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to take the applicant, so. so I'm going to have to recuse myself on San Jose. That's why I was going to okay. request that they be reversed. But I don't yeah, want and <laughs> Courtney has to recuse herself on Burlingame. Okay, okay so well, I forgot. Whatever's <laughs> fine. Okay. I'll recuse, recuse myself on San Jose for the same reason that I have property within 500 feet. Thanks. Me too. Okay, so that moves us to uh, item C, 115 San Jose. And uh, this is for two conditional use permits, item C and D. But we'll start off with item C. Is that Matt? Thank you, Chair Welch and uh, remaining commissioners. <laughs> Getting a little empty up there. Uh, tonight we have uh, an applicant requesting a conditional use permit for a takeout restaurant with six seats or less at 115 San Jose Avenue in the Central Village Zoning District. <coughs> Applicant is proposing to convert space 111 in the Capintola Mercantile, which was previously occupied by off the block snow cream and bubble tea, into a takeout restaurant with six seats or less. Space 111, shown here in blue, has exterior access from the parking lot adjacent to the Esplanade and interior access from inside the Mercantile. In the CV zone, restaurants, including takeout restaurants uh, or adding a takeout window to an existing restaurant, require a conditional use permit. The takeout restaurant will be Pizzeria La Bufala, which has another existing location in Abbott Square in downtown Santa Cruz. The six seats allowed for this use are shown on the floor plan in blue. The proposed business hours would be from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. daily, and uh, just of note, the prior establishment did not have a conditional use permit for a takeout restaurant. Here are the proposed south and west elevations. The proposed takeout restaurant has the same parking demand as the previous retail use and unpermitted takeout restaurant. Therefore, the project would not significantly impact the existing parking conditions. Uh, and just for your benefit here, I did a slide with uh, all of the existing spaces and their uses and what that works out to for required parking. And it's uh, round up to 44 spaces is the total. So the site plan submitted with this application uh, shows 41 parking spaces plus two unmarked spaces for the apartment for a total of 43 spaces. However, a site visit revealed that eight of the spaces shown on the site plan were non-existent. Spaces 1, 2, 41, 28, 12, 40, 37, and 38, uh, which brings the number of existing spaces down to 35. The staff has determined that some of the spaces were removed in order to create outdoor seating areas. Uh, but the removal uh, slash conversion of those parking spaces was never approved as part of a planning permit. In addition to the spaces, number 37 and 38 on the bottom right there by the Esplanade actually never existed. The last conditional use permit for a business in the Capitola Mercantile, which permitted the conversion of Caruso's restaurant from a takeout restaurant with six seats or less into a full restaurant use, was approved in 2005 based on the existence of 41 on-site parking spaces. That use change should have required an additional four spaces uh, to be provided on-site but the Planning Commission determined that the uses in the Capitola Mercantile had different peak times in terms of parking usage, and therefore made findings that the 41 existing on-site parking spaces were adequate. Staff recommends the Planning Commission require the owner to provide 41 on-site parking spaces prior to issuance of a building permit and or business license for the proposed project. This will bring the existing CUP for Caruso's restaurant into compliance uh, and allow the proposed pizzeria. The requirement to provide 41 on-site parking spaces is included as condition two of this condition, uh, of the conditions of approval. So with that, staff recommends the Planning Commission approve uh, application number 19-0140 based on the conditions of approval and findings. Okay, any questions for staff? No? Um, Dennis, are you gonna speak as the applicant? <coughs> Uh, 
Good evening, honorable members of the Planning Commission. Um, I'm representing Peter Dwyers, who's the owner of the Mercantile. Actually, I, I think Matt will back me out there. There's 40 spaces out there now. Is that correct, Matt? Yes. The, okay. the day I was out spaces. there at the site, Dennis uh, actually oh. restriped it that day. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure he did. Person. He made sure when he got down there that we had <laughs> yeah. the site. And so if, if, you, if you went down and visited, there is a little outside area that's used. And what's nice about that is it isn't used by the mercantile necessarily. There is a, 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 a pokey place there, but it's used by anybody that's walking down the street. It's a real nice public area. But it's off the side. It doesn't take any parking away. Um, right behind the gate to the left, there's actually a space right there. And we're proposing to actually put a bicycle parking in right there. Good. Um, and with the other applications coming up, I think that's be an important part of it because that's going to be most of the tenants. Um, uh, we're fine with all the conditions of approval. Um, we'll, we will pr produce 41 spaces there. Um, this is this is basically a takeout business. And if you've been down, down, downtown to Abbott Square, you'll see his business there. And he has a number of restaurants. This guy's been very successful in town here. And uh, I think he's a real good addition to our village. And uh, it's one of the few businesses, um, you think about this in the whole village, that provides its own parking. This business, this business of the mercantile provides its own parking. But uh, we'll agree with all the conditions, with the exception that Public Works gave us a list of, of, item, of, of uh, conditions to be removed. Danny sent a, a, a memo to, to you. Yes. Yeah, and that has to do with Public, public Works, um, such as erosion control and things like that. We're not, there's not gonna be any work outside the building. The building stays as is. And so those type of conditions, she did remove them on a memo. At the time, um, it was unclear whether they'd actually have to do some more significant work in the parking lot to provide those spaces. Okay. So those conditions were included, but when we figured out that they could just be restriped, that's perfectly fine to remove those. Okay. Thank you for your time. Great. Do we have anybody from the public that would like to speak on this? No? Okay, I'll bring it back to the commission for discussion and vote. Yeah, I would just like to see one additional condition added and... and hopefully added to all future takeout restaurants, so that they be required to provide an off-site trash container as approved by the city that matches whatever design our committee is gonna come up with. So for that condition, um, I'd like to run that by the Public Works Department. So it would be off-site or I think on-site would be more- Off-site. So we- Because that's where all the trash winds up, off-site. Yeah, they've done this with Pizza My Heart, so they have the con pizza box containers now along the uh, walkway in the Esplanade that was specifically for those boxes. And I believe there's a committee that's been looking at this for a long time. That's correct. That's correct. We've, um, in the past, th there was one CUP in which the property owner was required to pay an annual fee towards trash. So um, if we could... Um, if the condition could be a little more broad, possibly for, because to specify that it needs to be a trash collection site. So you mean a pizza collection box similar to the? I mean a trash container like, trash like we container. see them on the beach. Okay. The ugly ones that we have now that we ever can't seem to get anything uniform that looks <laughs> nice. Uh, whatever new design okay. the city comes up with to replace all those containers, I believe takeout restaurants should have to provide one of those somewhere off-site in the in the village and and okay. Nick are you you know they have the blue ones down there for the pizza boxes yeah You've I've seen, seen those yeah. so I don't know what the takeout boxes are gonna look like but maybe we can leave it up to staff to work with I don't know if the BI I don't know if the BIA put made them put those in or how that happened but it would seem unfair to put all the burden on one to go pizza place uh, maybe we could have staff work that out. Do you, you understand what we're? Trying I to do. do. I, I if um, I think it should state provide funding um, to provide the additional trash collection because I think typically the city would buy. You know, we want them to be uniform as you stated, but to cover the cost of an additional trash collection within the village. Okay. All right, Courtney. You have any questions or? Um, I had a couple of questions actually. The, um, can we go back to the site map? Mm -hmm. uh, the two parking spots that are right outside the entrance of the mercantile, I think that's the two, those two right there. They're facing the window. 
of the restaurant. Um, I was, and it just doesn't seem like there's any barrier from the cars to just kind of somehow lurch into the windows. I was wondering if we could make it a condition to have some type of barrier, either bollards or planters or something that's implemented between the cars and the windows. And then the second one was um, the bike racks that Dennis was talking about. I was wondering if we could make it somehow conditional that they could be free bike racks so they wouldn't have to be somehow, you know, you have to purchase the parking space for your bike. <laughs> Just, you know, thinking. <laughs> The, the gate is down when you come through, but you can walk around both ends of it. Right, right. I so, just, yeah, it's meant to be free. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So, but yes, yeah, so that's the intent. Okay. <laughs> it's just yeah. small details. Yeah, yes. yeah I, I want to get a clarification on that condition again, because you, you mentioned providing funding for trash collection. Okay, that's not what I'm looking for. My, my understanding in the last communication I received from, from Steve Jesberg was I, I think maybe perhaps the Arts Commission or somebody, some group, were looking at new trash containers uniform, of a uniform, aesthetically pleasing design for the village. And my condition would be that one of those be provided by the applicant. Okay. So are you, is someone going to put that in the form of a motion now? Okay, I would move approval with that additional condition. Okay, and the condition is that they buy a city-approved container for yeah. Um, yeah. their trash, off-site off -site trash cutter. So, second. So we have a motion, a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Very a good. point of clarification is, did you also want the bollards and oh, the bicycle parking requirements? That was not in the motion, so I don't. We could always bring it up in the next. Since we, I bypassed that, I forgot the comments. Well, I would have been my emotion, my motion to include that. Okay. To include that. Okay. Thank okay. You. Very good. Okay. So now we'll move on to uh, item C. I'm sorry, item D, which is also 115 San Jose for a gaming arcade. Correct. And I'll try not to keep. I'll try not to be too repetitive with this one. We're going to go over a little bit of the same stuff. So the applicant is requesting a conditional use permit for a gaming arcade at 115 San Jose Avenue. Um, Capitola Mercantile contains 11 commercial tenant spaces totaling 8,735 square feet along San Jose Avenue and the Esplanade. The occupied spaces in the Capitola Mercantile are currently a mix of retail and restaurant establishments. In the CV zone, commercial entertainment establishments such as theaters and amusement centers conducted within a closed building require a conditional use permit. The applicant is proposing to convert three commercial spaces, 102, 104, and 106, shown here, totaling 1,390 square feet in the Capitola Mercantile into a gaming arcade with 20 to 30 games. The three commercial spaces were previously occupied by retail shops. The arcade will be overseen by an on-site manager who will repair games and answer questions. Pro's business hours are from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. in the winter and 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the summer, seven days a week. There's the table. I'm going to go in a little more of the table this time. This table shows the current uses in the Capitola Mercantile and the required parking. Six tenant spaces are currently vacant. For this analysis, staff assume that the vacant spaces in the building were to be used for retail, bakeries, restaurants, slash takeout food establishments because th those uses have the lowest parking requirement of one parking space per 240 square feet. Based on that assumption, I came to the number of 44 required spaces. The parking demands for uses that fall under the commercial entertainment establishments category vary greatly, so Kimley Horn was hired to make a determination about the parking demand of the arcade use. Based on their technical memorandum, the video arcade use would generate less net vehicle trips than the existing retail components that would be replaced. Therefore, the project would not significantly impact the existing parking conditions. As I mentioned previously, you know, we'd recommend uh, getting back to the 41 spaces, which uh, the applicant is willing to do and almost there. Um, so that's also going to be conditioned to on this application simply because I didn't know which one was going to go first. So Great. it's going to be on both. So with that, staff recommends the Planning Commission approve application 19-0134 based on the conditions of approval and findings. Okay, any questions for staff? No. Uh, Dennis, you wanna? 
Is there anyone here besides Mick and I that remember the bowling alley? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was once a bowling alley, but it was actually, it had gaming and arcades in there in a restaurant inside that building. And the poison <laughs> spray. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and JoJo was a pin setter there, but they were not automatic pin setters then. They were manual pin setters. Um, and, and getting along with the same use in the village that you, you look at any old picture back in, clear, clear up until the 70s, uh, that the whole stretch from uh, the old merry-go-round or, the, or uh, Zelda's uh, outside eating area was the merry-go-round all the way down the stretch, all the way, if I'm not mistaken, all the way to uh, the Margaritaville was, was, was uh, ski ball. Okay, ski ball through that whole section there, you know. So gaming was a big thing. And it's feeling that maybe this is a time to bring that kind of arcade. In fact, the Capitol Mall now has this type of gaming arcade in it. And so what it does is it actually gives another use in the village for kids. It really gives them an opportunity to do it. And so we're suspecting that the majority of people that use this are going to be people coming there on bicycles or, you know, kids there for the summer since they use. And, and so um, this, is, this type of use is, is, uh, has a history in the village. And it's been a good use in the past, and, and the idea is to bring it back. Um, we're trying to develop a, a vision for the mercantile, and it's never had one. And um, it's never been able to, able to hold tenants in that building. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and, and I, you know, most of you know those. But one of the big ones is, is that it, to pull people off the street into an arcade thing like that, you need a variety of uses. And so if I was to give you a vision, I would say, if you've ever been to Napa, and they have a, a marketplace there, it's called the Oxbow Market. And it's a mixture of about 40 different businesses, small flower stands to a, to a to a oyster bar, to an herb place, and they're all within this, this mercantile building. We would hope that someday we can develop that. The more uses, the variety of uses there that would, they would create that. Um, we, in the in near future, are going to apply for a master use permit for the building. And what that'll save us is, is, that, is that both of these applications tonight, um, it's good that the public hears these. But when you're changing uses within a building, you can't put tenants off or people off for two or, two or three months to go through a process. And staff did a great job of getting this through very quickly, quickly for us. But I think that they should have the power to, once you have a use permit uh, agreement for, for this, this type of use, that they can make a decision of what, sh what, sh what, sh what can go in there without having to make a major process. Also, your planning staff, their time is very valuable. This doesn't seem valuable to me in use. I, there's so many things that they, they, should, they, they need to do out there. And this, if we develop a master use permit, that I think that we can take care of applications like this at the staff level instead of bringing them forward. But I appreciate your approval on this. And again, the only, we're, we're fine with the conditions of approval with the exception of the public works being removed. Okay. Thank you. Very good, Dennis. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak about this? I'm Rodney Wartok with Capitola Candy Company. I have 205 Capitola Avenue. I know a lot of these kids, the local kids and their parents, and I'm in full support of the arcade, full support. The only concern I have is supervision. I've been told that it's gonna be self-service and there's just gonna be somebody checking it on an hourly basis. And knowing these kids and our village, I don't think that's enough. And it's, it's what we need in the village, though I'm 100% supportive and I hope it happens. Okay. But my only concern is the supervision. Great. Thanks, Rodney. And I, it said they were going to have on-site management, but I guess is that a periodic thing? Is that what I'm hearing? So I'm hearing it through others, so I don't, I'm not for sure on it. So it's just something that I'm concerned about. Um, I heard it actually <coughs> from the property manager there. Okay. That it's going to be kind of hourly. Okay. Very good, Rodney. Thank you. Any questions for Rodney? Yeah, so no full-time attendant then. So I can't answer your that knowledge. for them, but that's that's to my knowledge. There's okay. not. It's self-service, and it's a little bit of a concern. Okay. Thanks, Rodney. Do you want me to address that now? Yeah, when we're done here. Wait, wait, wait. We have Karen's coming up. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, you couldn't afford to have a, a full-time person when you have 20 games there. It just doesn't, it doesn't, ma ma it doesn't mathematically work out. But what we have is we have a full-time person that's in charge of the mercantile. That is, you know, the maintenance guy and the custodian, and he does all that stuff. He's going to be around. Plus, when you have a use and you are surrounded with uses who have, t who have tenants and actually owners in there, you, you have that kind of supervision. In other words, 
there, the, the, if you've been in the building there, it's all glass across there. So the sight line goes through on, from every single business there to this. But you couldn't afford to have a full-time supervision at a place like this. It's just, it's just too small. It, is, it, is there someone on site though? Uh, not necessarily at the it, gaming, but a manager there? The manager, the manager of the uh, place lives on the property. He lives within Peter Dwyer's project there. Not, not in the apartment there, but the, you know, he lives above the, uh, above the ice cream store. But okay. he manages that whole corner there, and he's, he's around. And you know, he's, he's got to be responsible for the <clears> machines <throat> and keeping, keeping what it is. But it, it's a very visual area. It's not closed off as glass all the way through. So um, it doesn't work to have a full-time manager on it. Yeah, I, we hate to put the burden of supervision on the other businesses there, but um, we'll, we'll see how the process goes. Thanks, Dennis. Karn? Good evening, Karin Hanna. Um, I agree that this is um, kind of a, a, a use that we really need in the village because there are a lot of kids that come to, the, to Capitol and they don't necessarily all want to go to the beach. So I agree with Rodney, supervision is an issue. We have had a big increase in problems in the village with um, the kids and their scooters and the wheelie guys and that whole thing. And the police department does seem to be cracking down. Personally, maybe I'm hoping this will get some of them off the street into the building. So anyway, I'm basically here to support the project um, and just express, I, I think, you know, I think the police department's gonna, you know, is, is tuning up their whole, let's look at what these middle school kids are doing. And I, I, I think it's a, it's a good thing because um, it's gotten just a teeny bit out of hand in the last six months or so, but I am supportive of the project. I just hope that um, the other businesses there, again, aren't, you know, saddled with the responsibility of making sure everything goes smoothly. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Corn. Okay, anybody else from the public would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the Planning Commission. Well, if it doesn't go smoothly, it probably won't last very long. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> True. Yeah. I, I, I have a comment that's kind of unrelated, but Dennis mentioned some of the old casinos in the bowling alley down there. And just, <laughs> there's a new video that's been posted on the Capitola Museum website. It's, it's old eight millimeter films from 1952, I believe, that was posted by Brad McDonald, one of the community's first mayors. If you get a chance, go to the Capitola Museum on website, take a look at that. It's really a, a, a fun, old photograph video of uh, Capitola. But back to this, yeah, I, I don't really have a problem with it. I think if there are problems in, in the interior, I think uh, Mr. DeWars and the building manager will certainly hear about it. And uh, I think it has to be kind of self-policing in that regard. Okay. Courtney? I don't have any questions. Anybody want to make a motion? I'd move approval. I second. Okay, we have a first, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And so it moves forward. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. So um, now we're going to move into uh, Burlingame. And so I think we're going to get back two of our commissioners. And <laughs> we're going to lose one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the reason that you um, have to be recused is. I, I work for Fuse Architect. She works for the architect who has a project. So very good. Okay, so we're on item E, 523 Burlingame, and I'll let Matt explain the process. I wouldn't want to make you read through that whole thing and then have me repeat it, so. <laughs> right. Okay, so tonight, uh, the proposed project at 523 Burlingame Avenue includes a tentative parcel map to divide one parcel into three, a design permit for a single family home at 525 Burlingame Avenue, which has an accessory dwelling unit and is requesting a driveway width exception for perpendicular parking in the front yard within the R1 single family zoning district, a design permit for a single family home at 523 Burlingame Avenue within the R1 single family zoning district, and a design permit and conditional use permit for a fourplex on Capitola Avenue located within the CN neighborhood commercial zoning district. The presentation just so you know, is divided into those four distinct sections. Uh, so my plan of attack here was that uh, I can stop after each section for public comment and commissioner discussion, and then the planning commission could have a final discussion and take action at the end. Okay, very good. 
Uh, it is important to note that this application must be reviewed as one project to ensure compliance with state stormwater regulations. Any modifications within one lot may impact stormwater calculations for the entire site, and therefore any approval, denial, or continuation of the application should be for the entire site. So I'll start with the subdivision. The application includes a tentative parcel map dividing the existing parcel into three parcels. There's a zone change between the parcel on Capitola Avenue and the two parcels on Burlingame Avenue. At 524 Capitola Avenue, an 8,000 square foot par lot, parcel A, is proposed within the CN zone. The proposed lot measures 80 feet wide by 100 feet deep. At 523 and 525 Burlingame Avenue, two 5,000 square foot lots, parcel B and parcel C, are proposed within the R1 zone. The two lots measure 50 feet by 100 feet. The application complies with the lot design requirements for subdivisions in the Capitola Municipal Code. The applicant is proposing two new single-family homes on Burlingame Avenue within the R1 single-family zoning district and a fourplex, as I mentioned, at 524 Capitola Avenue in the CN zone. The proposed uh, single-family home at 523 Burlingame Avenue requires approval of a design permit and complies with all of the development standards for the R1 zone. The proposed single-family home at 525 Burlingame Avenue uh, requires approval of a design permit and a driveway width exception to allow parking space, parking space parallel to the street in the front yard setback, but otherwise complies with all the development standards for the R1 zone. The proposed fourplex at 524 Capitola Avenue requires approval of a design permit and a conditional use permit for multifamily housing. The fourplex complies with all the devel development standards for the CN zone, but it does not comply with the architecture and site review considerations related to site layout in the Capitola Municipal Code because it does not follow the established development pattern along the street. So I'm gonna just pause here for a second. I, I, I assume no one has comments or anything about the subdivision, but if you'd like to discuss anything about the subdivision, we can do that here. I do. Okay. If, so I, I was looking for the tentative map. I, is I, if I'm reading it correctly, the tentative map shows the new parcels and shows the old building before it was demolished. Is that what I'm Yes, I believe so. It seemed like a strange thing to do. It was hard to read. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know why you would want to know about a building that isn't there anymore. <laughs> that was strange. But I guess. So the tentative map will send out um, to our, to, to be reviewed by um, the public works director sends it out to a, um, a consultant, an engineer, and we'll provide them with notes of what they'll need to clean up before it gets recorded. And that would be one item I think for that cleanup. That would be a good note. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So next up, we're going to go to House One. The applicant is proposing a 2,991 square foot single family home with a 292 square foot attached accessory dwelling unit, or ADU, because I'll refer to that as an ADU later, at 525 Burlingame Avenue. The site is adjacent to the Dignity Health Medical Group Dominican to the north, uh, the proposed single family home at 523 Burlingame Avenue to the south, and the proposed fourplex apartments at 524 Capitol Avenue to the west. The proposed single-family home with the ADU complies with all the development standards of the R1 zone except for the maximum driveway width. The proposed two-story single-family home with the ADU exhibits contemporary design features along with organic accents to incorporate the new development into the Burlingame Avenue streetscape. The front of the home features natural wood accents, white or cream color stucco, and large bay windows with bronze anodized aluminum frames. The ground floor main entry of the home is tucked away under the massing of the second level. The awning, paired with the material transitions, differentiate the overall architectural massing of the building structure. I'll just go through the elevations here. This is the front elevation, the rear elevation, the north elevation, and the south elevation. The 2,999 square foot home is required to have four parking spaces, one of which must be covered. Uh, 
the ADU does not require any additional parking because the site is within half a mile of public transit, and even if the home did not have the ADU, it would require four parking spaces. The applicant has requested a driveway width exception to allow the fourth required parking space to be located perpendicular to the two tan tandem spaces in the driveway. The Capitola Municipal Code states that driveway width for residential uses in the R1 zone shall not exceed 20 feet unless an exception is granted by the Planning Commission due to unusual lot configuration, landscaping, or site design considerations. There are no special circumstances related to unusual lot configuration, landscaping, or site design that would justify a driveway width exception. The proposed parking setup creates a driveway width of almost 43 feet out of the 50 foot lot width for a 10 foot segment of the driveway, resulting in an 86% in 86% of the width of the front yard being utilized for parking. The project could have been designed to incorporate four parking spaces without a perpendicular space located in the front yard simply by providing a two car garage. Due to the inclusion of the ADU, the property received an extra 500 square feet of floor area compared to the maximum floor area ratio for homes on other lots of similar size. And only 292 square feet of that was used for the ADU. The extra 200 feet could have been used to provide one more covered parking space in the garage and meet the parking requirements without needing a driveway width exception while still having a home several hundred square feet larger than most other homes on similar lot sizes in the R1 district. Oh, sorry, and that was it for house number one. So I've got a question on your calculation uh, going back to the driveway width. Mm -hmm. So if I was to interpret that uh, ordinance, I would say that I would calculate it not as a 42 feet, but uh, the the car width basically i take a and b and then i'd take the measurement uh horizontally of the of the third space and say okay what is that that's still over the 24 feet but what would that be that'd be like 36 or 30 it's certainly not as egregious as your 30 but yeah so so, so uh, this parking arrangement has typically been discouraged in the city of capitola and uh, the way it's been discouraged is by calculating that as driveway width. So if you'd like to do that differently, we can change the well, policy. Uh, but that's, that's how generally when, when we get this a lot, actually, people coming in and proposing this parking arrangement, and we tell them no because that exceeds the maximum driveway width, with the purpose being we don't want parking all the way across the front of all the lots. So. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for staff on this? Okay. okay. Looks like there's no questions. Thanks. I'll move on into house number two. The applicant is proposing a 2,488 square foot single family home at 523 Burlingame Avenue. The proposed residence is sited adjacent to the proposed single family home at 525 Burlingame Avenue to the north, an existing single family home at 521 Burlingame Avenue to the south, and the proposed fourplex apartments at 524 Capitola Avenue to the west. This home complies with all the development standards of the R1 zone. The proposed two-story single-family residence exhibits contemporary design features, including natural wood, white stucco, and dark anodized bronze accents. The front facade of the home is articulated with a small bronze-colored trellis and bronze anodized garage door to break up the white stucco facade and provide an inviting approach from the main driveway. The home has a flat roof on the ground floor level, which is clad with vertically set natural cedar, and the second level of, and garage have sloped gable roof lines with minimal eaves. The second level includes a partially cantilevered covered deck that sits above the ground level patio at the rear of the home, creating a small covered area for outdoor dining. So there's the front elevation, there's the rear elevation, um, and the top part you see there is that uh, cantilevered deck that comes out which you see here on the right, on the north elevation, and on the left, on the south elevation. And that's it for house number two. Okay, any questions for staff from class number two? No? Okay. This, this is we'll the easy move one. Move to so. the fourplex, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the fourplex. The applicant is proposing a 5,340 square foot fourplex apartment building at 524 Capitola Avenue. The four apartments are relatively small, measuring 633, 633, 728, and 742 square feet each. The proposed fourplex is sited adjacent to the Dignity Health Medical Group Dominican to the north, the commercial office building at 522 Capitol Avenue to the south, and the proposed single-family homes at 523 and 525 Burlingame Ave to the east. 
The proposed fourplex at 524 Capitol Avenue complies with all of the development standards of the CN zone. However, staff has concerns with the site layout of the fourplex, which will be covered later. The proposed two-story fourplex incorporates contemporary design features, and the two stories are differentiated through materials with stucco on the first story and a combination of natural wood and aged ash horizontal siding accents on the first and second stories. The ground level of the building has differentiation in the setbacks to break up the massing along Capitol Avenue. Two of the garage doors are recessed eight feet three inches behind the other two garage faces, giving the building a more articulated approach. The building facade is further articulated with bronzed anodized aluminum garage doors, windows, and clear glass railings on first level patios, front stairs, and second level decks that break up the massing across the front of the building. So here's our front elevation, rear elevation, north elevation, <coughs> and south elevation. <coughs> The Capitola Municipal Code identifies considerations which the Planning Commission must analyze in review of a design permit. Staff has concerns with the site layout for the fourplex relative to consideration D1, site layout, which includes the orientation and location of buildings, decks or balconies, and open spaces in relation to the physical characteristics of the site, the character of the neighborhood, and the appearance and harmony of the buildings with adjacent development, such that privacy of adjacent properties is maintained. Within this stretch of Capitol Avenue between Beulah Drive and Bay Avenue, there are numerous mixed-use and multifamily structures. The majority of these existing developments, shown here in red, have a single curb cut and shared driveway leading to shared parking. The proposed design does not follow the established development pattern along the street. Each of the units in the fourplex has a garage facing Capitola Avenue and driveways that split off of the two main driveways that connect to the public street. The end result is a building set back 28 feet from the street with a larger than typical front yard consumed by pavement and parking. The design of the fourplex could have incorporated one shared driveway leading to a shared parking area, similar to the development pattern along, established along Capitol Avenue. In the CN zone, uh, multiple dwellings or groups or combinations thereof require a conditional use permit. Um, Capital and Municipal Code states that in considering an application for a conditional use permit, the Planning Commission shall give due regard to the nature and condition of all adjacent uses and structures, um, and you may impose requirements and conditions with respect to the location, design, siting, maintenance, and operation of the use as may be necessary for the protection of the adjacent properties and in the public interest, and to preserve the integrity and character of the district, and to secure the general purposes of this title, general plan, and the local coastal program. As stated previously, staff has concerns with the site layout relative to the amount of driveway area in the front yard and the number of garage doors facing Capitola Road. Oh, sorry, Avenue. <laughs> staff recommends the planning mission continue project application 180508 for modifications. Specifically, the fourplex at 524 Capitol Avenue should have a single curb cut and shared driveway leading to a shared parking area on the side or rear of the building and the single family home at 525 Burlingame Avenue should be modified to comply with the maximum driveway width. As I mentioned earlier, the application must be reviewed as one application to ensure compliance with state stormwater regulations. Uh, should the Planning Commission approve the application as proposed, draft findings and conditions of approval are included as attachment 10, and uh, there was an additional uh, set of conditions from Public Works Department that should be included as well. That concludes the presentation. Okay, any questions for staff on the fourplex? We've got lots. So, first of all, did, was there a preliminary review of this design where they came in and talked to you about the, the whole general concept? Yes, uh, we met uh, several times with the applicant and uh, the project has changed over time as most do. Originally, the whole front was four driveways very close together without, without the sort of landscaping you see now. Um, that exceeded the driveway width on the apartments, uh, which led to the modification that had the two 15-foot driveways that then split off. So I guess I'm asking that question with regards to the, your recommendation that there be a single cut and parking in the rear. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I couldn't find anything in the code that said that's a requirement or even a recommendation that there should be rear parking. Did I? So um, there was a prior meet there, there were meetings um, prior to them developing a plan and discussion of, you know, in our, just the 
I know I, I met with the um, with Fuse Architecture across the street, and we discussed um, just the pattern along the street and concerns for you know that it should fit within the pattern. I also gave them a copy of you know the new code and where you know we had a lot of conversations about the mixed use district and where things were headed. But I mean that code is not in effect at this time. But um, the the current code under the design permit findings does talk about um, you know being relative to the neighborhood and also the conditional use permits so or the conditional that seems use permit general i was i was specifically you seem very specific in your recommendation that there that there should be rear a single driveway cut and rear parking and although you've shown that there are many other areas uh, other houses in the area that have that style I didn't see anything even in the new code that said that is a preferred style that we want rear parking in the rear in mixed use areas was there something I missed or? I think it is clearly stated in the new code um, about parking either being preferred not required but preferred on the side or to the rear of the lot <laughs> in shared parking I, I looked at it recently but that's not under you know the new code does not apply to this property so um, just in preliminary discussions we discussed that at a high level conceptually before they had drafted plans and then as as the plans came in um, the discussion continued on the um, our recommendation to follow the pattern of the street of shared parking for a multi, you know, for a multi-unit complex, but but there's no violation in terms of driveway widths or parking, or it's really this recommendation that the new code says we prefer parking in the rear. I I, I wish I could. I wish there is could. there is not a standard in the code today that states that parking. Yeah, but well, even the new code. I mean, the precedent would be we wanna we wanna start following the new code, and I know in the Frank uh, or Arkansite Ar uh, architect on the Arkansite committee recommended that as well. Said you know, hey gosh, I wish it was in the parking was in the rear. Um, and if the new code says it's in the rear, I would think that that would be um, something maybe we would want to insist on. But if but if it isn't there, um, you you cannot require anything from the new code at this point. Our the under this review, it has to the review has to be based on the code that's in place and in staff's um, analysis on this project. It's the design finding that Matt brought up on the slide, and also the conditional use permit criteria um, regarding neighborhood and fitting them within the neighborhood and. That's all right. Yeah, and I no maybe, maybe Commissioner Newman remembers. Uh, I recall having the conversation when we were writing the code. My memory seems more like it was towards retail and office space that we're trying to get it out to the sidewalk. And um, but I can't recall, recall exactly the terms of it. This uh, site is uh, zoned for commercial or residential, right. so kind of it's a it's a mixed bag. It's mixed. Yeah. So are are you? I'm done. Go ahead. Um, I, I, not only the tentative map, but I, I have trouble reading these plans in a lot of different ways. So that I don't know why. They're difficult to read. They're difficult, yeah. So anyway, is the frontage 80 feet on this? Uh, yes. Okay. I, I found, finally found that. So the two driveway cuts are 15 feet each, right? So 30 feet out of 80 feet would be driveway. Now, if we did one driveway to the back, that would probably be 20 feet, wouldn't it? Because you'd have more. So we're... We're talking about 30 feet of driveway versus 20 feet of driveway on 80 feet of frontage, just to kind of get the numbers out there. Yeah, and then, I mean, the option also would be to have, um, if if we're going to look at that, not just from the rear, but maybe from the side as well. But um, is there any more questions for staff? And maybe we can let the applicant come up and explain if they have a. Dan, you're going to come? Okay, yeah. thanks. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Dan Gomez. I'm with Fuse Architects. Uh, where would you like me to start? 
<laughs> I know it's a big well, project. Yeah, so we can start we, from the top on the tentative parcel split, or we can start on each individual let, project. Let's just let's ask where we start. Let's start with number one, the tentative. Do you have any questions about the tentative parcel split? It doesn't sound like it. So okay. house number one. I, I I had heard a concern about like why we show the existing the old convalescent home on that site map. Oh, on the tentative map, yeah, I don't think. But you that need. that kind of clarified. Well, I don't think you need to show that. Well, it the reason it was. Us. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was shown because there's um, calculations that are done to support the previous versus impervious surface area. Right. For the camera. So you have to kind of relate that. Well, if it's old, an empty the site, then they condition. consider it all impervious surface, and then your stormwater so, calculations. So you come mixed a whole up animal. a tentative map with kind of a improvement. Uh, yeah, but issue. it was part of the yeah. requirement. Yeah. So okay. So house then, number house one. number one. Any questions about? Which is house number one is uh, which one are we referring to as house number? That's uh, that 525, 525, I believe. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that the one with the exception or not? Parcel B. That is the one with stuff. the exception. Yeah, that's the one with the extra parcel. driveway. Yeah. The so we, you yeah. should talk about that exception because that's up for grabs here. This is the parking. Right. Yeah. The parking exception. Okay. So um, if you notice, can we go back to the site map that shows the parking layout on that one? Oh, there you go. So um, if you look at the, where the red, uh, the parking spot that is dictated by the red rectangle there, mm -hmm. the reality of kind of this site, and I, I, we believe we submitted some uh, documents that kind of show the actual streetscape to the Planning Commission earlier today, and you will see that the actual edge of pavement is well beyond the property line. So if you see where the two tandem, uh, the parking spaces behind the parking space located in the garage, located in the two blue rectangles there. That's the property line, right? So beyond that is actually another, um, I think we're more like 15 feet from the red rectangle to the actual edge of pavement, but that is not even the road. So then there's another section of area where a car can park there in the street currently now and in, in the future. So the crown of the road is actually further away. So our proposal actually has a berm that is uh, approximately 10 feet wide that is all landscaped as a, as a buffer to that. And it's not only just a flat portion of landscaping, we actually proposed a mound to kind of d to discreetly cover that spot to minimize the impact of what a parking space would be. And if you kind of look at the, the way that the municipal code is written now, it talks about garages and garages, uh, are kind of discouraged to be the main focal point of a property. And so in doing so, we wanted to kind of minimize that as well. And this being an ADU, it's actually gonna be used as a, as a family residence with the, the option to have the ADU, he has a large family. And it's nice to have the parking minimized and the garage frontage minimized. So what we did is we tried to landscape that area so that it protects and preserves kind of the street frontage so that it's, it's softer and you're not seeing so much of a, a large focus on the garage element. So if you go back to the front rendering, if you don't mind. And do we have copies of the plans that we submitted? Uh, not digital. Not digital copies? No, I, can't, I can't put them on the screen right now. Do we have copies that I could distribute at all of the showing kind of this? These are the ones you sent, there, sent out today? Yeah, these ones we sent out today. Do you guys have copies of those? I have a copy. I don't know if anyone else does it. If you go to... They each have a printed copy. Okay. So if you see the one that has the site plan on the back that shows the green area that's hatched and also has a rendering showing a car parking in front of the bermed area. Is it, is it labeled house one parcel? House one parcel lot proposed development. Right. They're next to each other, those okay. predictors. Yeah. And you can kind of look at the before and after too. So there's one that has a site plan and there's one that has the two images showing the oh, yes. perspective of the existing empty lot and the perspective of the proposed house with the same car in the same location. Right. So you can see where the property line actually starts beyond where that car sits now. And then the berm goes another 10 feet beyond that landscape berm and then it shows a silhouette of a car parked in front of the does everybody have a copy of there 
What, how does that car get to that spot? Through that driveway right there. I mean, just looking at the plan. Oh. I not know if there's a car yeah, parked on the street. That isn't, so that, that, I think that was, uh, Matt read a comment about the width of the driveway, and I think that's a little misleading in that, like uh, Commissioner Welk stated, that I think you said that the driveway width was considered how many feet wide? Uh, almost 43, 4210. 4210. So I think that takes into consideration that there, it almost um, leads you to believe that that driveway exists, the full frontage of that property, when it really doesn't. It's a driveway. You drive in the actual driveway and turn to the left to park. So and the landscape area, so it's is a buffer the to that. Area so the, at the street is much narrower than. It's a two-car driveway, okay. correct? What's to stop an RV or a boat from being stored on that parking space? Which parking space? One that's perpendicular to the driveway. Well, that's the case for I guess any house, right? They could park an RV or. And in any front yard. Yeah, but not not one that is parallel to the front of the house that blocks the whole front of the house and becomes the focal point on the street. Well, that's I guess that's a, a matter of of hearsay. They're not they're not really gonna. We can't control that. I guess you can say. No, I you mean, can't control. You that. can't control it. And that's my concern. In regards to the actual material of this area, we want this to be a paved, impervious surf or pervious surface that is uh, turf block, whatnot, so that it can actually be. The intent is that you're, it's not going to be really used for parking. I mean, it meets the code requirement. So, we provided it with the intent to provide as much buffer as possible for this area. Okay. Any, any more? You have more questions? No, I'm you still not getting. Oh, uh, maybe a question for staff. Uh, I'm trying to, to. I'm trying to imagine this 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 berm and this buffer. I mean, at what point? How big would that be before it's not even considered your front yard anymore, and the driveway just kind of goes back, and now it's really. You know what I'm trying to say? It's like, okay, this is his front yard, but it's a it's a recessed front yard. And yeah. so, I mean, if he was to put, uh, you know, I'm just wondering if, if there's a, a, a definition of the depth of a front yard that, that you can't have a drive, can't have cars in. And that as long as he, he provides, you know, a lawn or whatever in that space, he can, you know, duck, duck around it. It has been 15%. 15 feet. 15 feet. Hasn't it? From the lot line 15 feet back that is technically the definition of the front yard so if he has a, his l-shaped driveway beyond that 15 feet then it's not his front yard and the code doesn't apply well you can have parking outside of the front yard setback i think the parking setup would still be discouraged under the same thing so for the first 15 feet from the property line back is where you know you can have your the 20 foot wide driveway and typically we discourage parking in the front yard area but there's a practicality to it that you need to accommodate your your spaces and so the the first two spaces are within the 15 feet mm -hmm. um, but then as you turn I believe that's also in the 15 foot setback so, so uh, that's my question. If it wasn't in the 15 feet, if that was set back far enough so that that berm is, was actually 15 feet wide, would that be a violation? You know, the intent of the 20 foot width of a driveway is to limit how much parking is taking up the front yard of an area, whether it's not the, the technical front yard of the setback or the site itself. But um, Well, I'm trying to... I understand the technical be. aspect. So if the front yard is, defi is defined as 15, 15 feet, feet mm -hmm. then if he has a driveway beyond that, you wouldn't have this violation. You would, just, you would just fall back on, well, it doesn't meet community standards, it doesn't look nice, da da da. But it, that wouldn't violate a specific code as long as that L shaped driveway was 15 feet back. 
No, it would still violate the width of a, a driveway width. A, the driveway width is limited to 20 feet. So even if the driveway were to go back and then expand into the L shape, at that point we would calculate the driveway width as the 43 feet. So, so we're saying the width of the driveway because it's in a s setback area, it's that full width of the parking spot and the uh, entry to the driveway. I mean, if you look at what was presented this afternoon, uh, that landscaped area, the entry into the driveways is how wide? Do we know what that is, Dan? The, the, the 20 feet wide? Is it just is 20 the feet? the actual 20 feet wide, yeah. Yeah, so it becomes at 44 feet because of the park, the parking spot and when it makes that L, which I, I guess for me, if we're looking at what is the intent of, of having the driveway width limited to 20 feet is to have this uh, area one for parking on the street and two for a landscape area, which to me, it looks like they meet the intent. I, I have this exact same thing in my house. There's a number of them on, up on Depot Hill and throughout our area where they, we've actually allowed parking in this configuration, but some of them not even to this step. So that landscaped area is one, it's in the city's right of way. Is that correct? A portion of it. Yeah, and then how big of that area is in, in the, off the property line? Um, well, that, that area, I think that parking number four is a 10 by 18. 18, or is that 9 by 18? I can't remember. It's 10. Is it 10 by 18? So then it's 5 feet. So 5 feet, five is, feet is on the property itself. 5 feet on the property, yep. then 10 and feet. Then another, and then another 5 foot 3 is on the, in the city right away. So we have a 10 foot buffer there, but part of that's shared. In Correct. So I guess my point was that is if that that five feet w that you just mentioned that is theirs uh, was expanded to 15 feet somehow magically <laughs> then then they would have a case that says well we meet the letter of the law because the front yard is in fact uh, in full existence and we and we don't have a driveway in our front yard it's it's back beyond the front yard the driver width's not tied to front yard. That's why uh, Katie and I both clarified that and said that even if it was outside the 15 feet, that we would still calculate that perpendicular spot as width of driveway. So this doesn't correspond to front yard. Interesting. That means my driveway That's technically is 80 feet wide then. And okay. Like I said, this is not the clean, cleanest definition. This is right. uh, the interpretation of the driveway width in the code um, with the purpose of dissuading front yard parking all the way across lots. And that's been done for a, the entire year and a half I've been here, and there have been many applicants displeased with the fact that they could not do this. Right. Um, and that's just been the policy. So if you want to start permitting this, you know, we can. No, I, I understand. <laughs> I think I think we understand the intent and where that's at. Before we let Dan go sit down, is there any other questions for? Yeah, I just have, I'm curious, uh, this has never been allowed in the past, but is it allowable now to use city right of way to meet your landscape requirements? N no, the, no, anything that's, you know, the city allows you to use, if we're not utilizing the right of way, we actually encourage you to use the landscaping area in front of your home. Right, um, but, you can't, but it you doesn't can't count it to get an approval for a no, this plan. No, that area would not count as part of their setback requirement, nor would any parking that occurs in that area count towards their parking requirement. And we hadn't seen that, by the way, in, in what they shared today until today. So that, we, that was not calculated in any of their landscaping okay. numbers. So. Correct. Yeah, we didn't, we, didn't, uh, we didn't assume that we were just adding that as an additional buffer. Right. Okay. Even though we're fully planning it on landscaping the five feet that's on our property. Right. We didn't take that into our calculations. Okay. Does everyone have enough information to... Okay, so we have that one. Do we want to talk about uh, house number two now? Any questions regarding, okay, any questions regarding the fourplex? Or did we start off there? I can't remember, I'm going back now, no. Fourplex, again, I would ask that uh, you might wanna address the uh, driveway issue. Yeah, so um, maybe I'll start back a ways. Actually, we came up with a plan for this property and then we did go and we met with staff and we discussed it. And I believe uh, in that meeting, Katie expressed that in the new code that they were gonna try to get parking in the back and underneath. So we went back and actually tried that. And 
for the purposes of what we were, our clients were trying to do and for what we thought was appropriate for this part of Capitola, it, it, we, we tried many options and it really doesn't work. We've actually worked on a project that actually does have parking underneath just down the street at 512 uh, Capitol Avenue. And it meets parking requirements, but oh my word, to actually park your car in there and to try to get it out is a nightmare. You end up having to wiggle yourself around and try not to hit the building and it's, it's really a nightmare. So, um, and the reality is, is on the ground floor, there's no there's no connection with uh, the, the street. I mean, you're, you, you, you try to force as much livable space you can down at the bottom, but on this site in particular, it eliminated any, any useful space other than parking on the ground floor. So having that whole bottom section of, of, of parking was underneath the building uh, was not feasible from what our studies um, produced. So in regards to parking in the back, it pushed the building so far forward to the street and it minimized what they could actually do just to get to parking in the back that it, it also was unfeasible. And for personal reasons there's, that I will um, potentially let one of the clients speak about is uh, street noise and trying to <coughs> minimize the amount of street noise to the occupants in the building. So by pushing it back and giving it a little more street presence uh, with, with landscaping, our goal was to try to create as minimal as possible the even though it has two driveways it's still only it's like uh matt said it's it's 30 feet and we're allowed to have 30 feet of driveway off of that street in that in that front 15 yard setback so um ultimately we we know that uh there's lots of properties around and i think you highlighted a site map that showed the properties that have parking in the back if you wouldn't mind going back to that site plan There we go. So out of those spaces, um, Katie and Matt, I don't know if you're aware, how many of those are, are commercial buildings? I think all of them are, right? If I'm aware, I think they're all office buildings and or commercial uses, or at least a majority of them are. Um, I know at least a few of them on the west side of the street uh, to the south were residences. One. Like if you look at like First if you three for sure. Are. Well, Dignity Health right next to our building, right? Dignity is uh, is commercial, and they actually do have parking on the front street side as well. Um, the building just south to us is, um, I believe, a mortgage or real estate business. Has two curb cuts and drive and parking in the front. There's the house just adjacent to the south of that that you didn't highlight also that has parking in the front and parking in the rear. I think they all have, they, and, and they actually park right on the street frontage. So if you look at it, I mean, a majority, of, there's, there's kind of a mix of how this works and very few of them have actually a, a, any landscaping up front. And so our goal was to like say, okay, we do have the two split driveways. They're 15 feet wide. They meet the, they meet the code max and if you saw from that rendering, I mean, the idea was is to populate it with landscaping, to defer some of that street noise to the occupants, and also to create a, a nice walking area. I mean, these are these are residences, not a commercial use. So, um, that being said, you can see, I mean, the, the amount of landscaping that is going in that front courtyard that accesses the bottom. There's a bottom unit underneath the two-story middle unit, um, and then there's the stair access way that accesses all the three upper units. So when you landscape that initially at the time of construction, are you using specimen trees? Yeah, we have a landscape plan that, uh, that specifies. Are you using specimen trees, fully grown trees? Or are you just using the box, 15-gallon well, uh, box Well, trees? of course, I mean, uh, time permitting, I mean, if, if okay. we're, we're gonna plant trees that okay. will grow. <laughs> if so it's a requirement to probably, put in specimen the trees, The landscaping we we're that. seeing there is probably about 10 years down the road. Well, how do you want to propose, like, I mean, ultimately, if that's a condition that says, hey, you got to install mature trees, that could be a condition. But at this point in time, it's, this is the envisioned design and the proposed design. So um, the landscaping, obviously, to buffer that, it, this probably has the most landscaping out of any, any project on, along the street facade. So in our opinion, I mean, it's, it's actually pushed back from the street 
it's it's I believe we are about twenty eight feet or so back. I have to look at the actual measurements. That's, that's here. correct. Is that correct? Yeah. And so I'm. Um, in respect to the parking in that issue, we, we, we did study that, and it ultimately, this was a great solution. Every, there's two private garage, two parking tandem garages in one side, so actually there's only two spots that are dedicated for outs, outside parking. We have, the, the other six are enclosed parking spaces. Okay, any other questions for Dan? Dan, any other comments? Um, yeah, there was uh, one other condition here real quick here that I think that... Uh, I believe there was a mention of, uh, in the staff report, about four driveways. Is that correct? Or four, it says here... It said two branching into four. I think it was the way it was Two described. branching into four, and, and that is... And, and I think that is... a. Uh, Kind of an inac inaccurate statement. It's it's two driveways leading to four Doors. garages, correct. And if you notice the intent of them, they're actually if you look at the plan, they're they're actually stepped back from each other. So to create a recess between the two, so it's not you're not looking at garage, 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 garage. There's actually some inundation between <coughs> the two, between the facades. Okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Dan. Okay, thank Is you. there anybody else that would like to come forward? Go ahead. And if you could just give us uh, your name when you come forward. My name's Matt Howard. Uh, my brother, John, and my sister-in-law, Carrie, and my wife, Laura, are, are we got collectively the whole, doing we, the project. So. We've got the whole family. All right. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> it's a big deal to us, so we appreciate uh, the commissioner's time and, and thoughts and efforts around this project. Um, I want to tell a little bit of a history so you guys um, get a flavor for who we are and what we're trying to accomplish because there's rationale behind this project. It's a project with purpose. We are not private equity guys doing the mall. We're not uh, developers trying to flip a house. We're locals that have been here for a long time um, trying to, to build homes for ourselves and uh, candidly a, a unit for our, our my nephew and their child. So. Um, uh, so the history of our family goes back. My sister-in-law owns a house at 206 Stockton Avenue, and it's been in her family since 1905. So she's been around a while, and um, they all lived there sh shortly, I think. Uh, my grandparents um, honeymooned here in 1928. My grandmother bought a house on Westcliff Drive in 1969. We thought she was nuts, and I, we hoped that we were that nuts someday as well, because it worked out pretty good. Um, uh, my dad opened a store in the brand new Capitola Mall in 1970, like 77, 78, uh, at which we've worked as children and young adults for our lives. Um, it goes on and on and on. I was a lifeguard at the beach here in Capitola. My son, Mitchell, is a junior lifeguard instructor this year and a, a local as well. You'll see him on his bike riding through town uh, surfing. So to your question about what's going to be in my front yard, there'll never be an RV in my front yard. There will be bikes and surfboards and kids and that, that type of mess. So for that, I apologize ahead of time. So we're local. Well, we intend to um, bring great value to this community. We know there's a housing crisis. We're trying to do, um, do, do well by doing good. And so our, our thought process is we're here. We're going to add six housing units to this community. Um, we love this community. Um, I, we've lived, John and I have both owned uh, condos or homes in town one way or another. I live in Soquel right now, and I'm anxious to get out of the woods and come down and live in the village. So the purpose of this project, so that you, you, you scratched your heads a little bit and thought, why not do the parking in back or on the side? <clears throat> we have a purpose, and the purpose is, and you probably saw in the package, we have a special needs nephew and child that needs, um, that we think we could make a meaningful impact in his entire life by doing the project the way we're doing it. So there's not a random nature to the, the, the building uh, on Capitol Avenue, it's really purposeful and thoughtful, and we're hoping that Andrew um, can can uh, do that. So um, I've rambled a smidge. We appreciate your public service in doing this um, for the community. Um, I will say, uh, um, if you look at this package entirely, we think um, you know we've taken 
what was a, a you know a, a, an old nursing home we took a lot of risk to buy it and try to figure out the details around this and if it if, if it comes down to one parking spot on a project of this size I would you know request the, the council's um, you know gracious permission to move forward we've been going at this for a couple of years now and um, it's expensive and timely and, and disconcerting to get delayed. So with that, let me turn it over to Carrie and talk about the special needs. Thanks, Matt. Hi. Um, so Matt gave the context of the, the family relationship. This is, we're building kind of a family compound. And as you, I'm not sure if you read the letter that I wrote, um, but uh, we have a son who is now 19 years old with autism and um, as he's gotten older, we realize that he's going to need 24-7 care. And um, with the state of affairs with so many kids with autism, 80% of them end up living with their parents for their lifetime. So we're, we were looking at um, trying to find something for our son where the two of us and our son could all grow old together. And Matt, being um, very involved in real estate, he started helping us try to find properties where we could, you know, the three of us could live together. And, um, and the, the special needs world is a whole nother animal than building a house. But anyway, this property came up and he, Matt approached us and said, you know, would you guys be interested? And we were like, oh my gosh, yes, because currently we live over in Prospect Heights neighborhood and our son to get to a public bus stop takes 20 minutes for him to walk there. And so we thought, oh my gosh, Capitola Village, he could literally, there's a doctor's office right next door. Bus there's stops, a bus stop 50 feet away. 50 feet away. There's Knob Hill. He would have so much to access. So we met with Dan Gomez and Courtney Christensen and um, we would bring Andrew with us and he being who Andrew is um, he walked down to the fire department and introduced himself and they were talking he was talking to one of the firefighters and they said oh you know what are you doing here and he said oh I'm moving here and they said where and he said the golden age convalescent hospital <laughs> So um, anyway, and he met the gentleman that was here earlier this evening who owns the candy shop. So, you know, he's already kind of integrated himself into the community and, and we just are so grateful to Capitola because they are embracing him. And um, so anyway, um, uh, so back to Fuse, we approached Courtney and Dan and we talked to them at great length about this idea of how can we build this property with Matt and Laura and eventually our son being able to live in an apartment by himself. That's our goal. And so um, we discussed at great lengths the necessity for his safety. Um, and so they really listened to what we had to say and they were able to design all three properties so that um, we could all live with some privacy but be connected and all of that. And so if you look at our property, we're at the 525. Could you actually pull that yeah. up? The idea was that oh, the bottom, the, the apartments the and- The full site plan. No. There, there, yeah. there you go. So the idea was was that the Andrew could eventually be in the bottom unit in the apartment complex, and that way he would be able to access the backside of our property, and um, and so Dan and Courtney designed it this way so that there was no, you know, we, there's a fence line. There could be a fence line there, but there would be a way for Andrew to get to the backside of our property without having to cross the street. Or a parking lot or anything like that and so um, there were th there's all kinds of different little intricate things about this design that I don't want to bore you with all the details unless you're interested but um, it, it, so just a vision I'd like to be able to sit in my kitchen and have a cup of coffee and look out and see that he's in his kitchen having a cup of coffee and say you good yeah dad I'm good that's all I'm looking for yeah 
And so um, we are an open book and um, we just would hope that if you have any questions about anything about the property that you not make any assumptions, but just ask us and we're more than happy to share um, our, story. our story and Dan's and our vision. Thank you, Ms. Howard. And we, you know, I did get a chance to read <laughs> your letter, so that was that was nice. I appreciate you sharing that information with us. Okay. Any questions of the Howards before they sit down? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And it looks like that's about. Anybody else that would like to get up and talk about this project? No. Nope. Seeing none. Then I'll bring it back to the commission, and we can have a discussion. So we we basically have four different items that we've talked about, but it's got to be. And we could talk about them individually and get to a final resolution for one final vote. I can st I can start. We have the like. right. House A B. Which which one is A? A is the the no, northerly wait. one there. So there's. Do you want to do my address or what we were calling House Number One and House Number Two? House Number One, House Number Two. Okay. House Number One is at the upper right, and it's okay. the one with the driveway with the exception. Okay. House Number One is the one with the parking lot parallel parking spot parallel. parallel to the street. Uh, I'd be willing to consider a variance to eliminate that parking spot and allow them to have one less parking spot than required. That's my per opinion on that. House number two, I don't have any issues with. Okay. To me, that's a, a great design, fits right into the neighborhood. The apartment building, uh, I wish with your history of Capitola and the longevity of your family being here, that the design had a better appreciation and feel for the village. Uh, I looked at the, the land use plan and uh, the various policies and, and just about everyone verba verbatim states that any development in the village has to honor the, the, the characteristics and uniqueness and the beachy feel of the, of the village. Uh, there's another document that's not an official document. Uh, three years ago, I was part of a core group uh, along with myself and former Mayor Gail Ortiz and City Manager Susan Westman, uh, Council Members Story and uh, Bertrand and uh, several other people. And we uh, developed a document called Vision Capitola. And in the process of developing that document, we held two community meetings. Uh, first one had over 100 people participating. The second one had, I think, 98 people participating. We handed out several thousand surveys, and we got a return of almost 1,000 surveys. And basically, that document was asking people what their vision was for Capitola in the future, what they wanted to see five, 10 years down the road. And one of the number one criteria, one of the things they held most valuable, dearest in this town was the village, that they wanted to preserve the uniqueness and the character and the quaintness of the village. So looking at those plans, then I put it on next door. And I know that's generated a lot of comments, okay? Uh, if you look, there were 44 responses. I, I closed that next door website this morning and uh, printed out the, the last remaining comments and provided it to everybody up here. But those comments ran about 80% against this particular design and felt that it didn't really meet the characteristics and special quality that we feel in the village. And I would just, my own personal opinion in that regard, I don't think the community really accepts this design. I don't think it meets our policies. and. I would like to see it redesigned to be something that better fits in the village. That's where I'm at. Peter? Um, I think it does meet the uniqueness and character of the village. Um, I, I don't want to weigh in on whether or not a modern design is better than a craftsman design or a beachy design is different than a train station design or or what have you I think the notion when, when I've read the guidelines on um, on what the feel and the uniqueness character of the village is um, they're they're the kinds of things that were addressed here it was um, 
not blocky, I mean, not uh, blank faces, very pedestrian friendly, landscaping, varied uh, surfaces, those things are all met. Um, so I don't have any problem with the design of um, the building and don't want to be part of the fashion police. Um, and so, and so I disagree with respectfully with Councilman Ruth that this doesn't meet those requirements. I do have a problem with uh, house number one. Um, I think that we need as government officials need to provide a predictable and consistent front and that when you go to the planning uh, staff and um, get some advice that it's advice that is valuable and that we will stand behind so um, th that's why I pushed on this notion of uh, um, what defines a driveway what's how you measure it this this and that and um, <clears throat> it seems to me that we would be undermining staff to allow that driveway because we gave them clear guidance with the rules they followed it and for us to undermine that um, makes us in unpredictable and inconsistent so I, I I'm intrigued by the notion of the variance um, as a way around that um, I'd like to explore that if anybody wants to talk about that more but my that's my only problem with this project is that is that one driveway um, or the one parking space number four um, so I, I would I would send it back for that reason alone but I would consider the variance idea okay well I've got about four or five different items to discuss here first of all um, I think the overall development and site plan for this uh, site is brilliant and uh, provides a lot, provides housing. Uh, it's interesting because I've been in real estate as a lawyer and an investor for 40 some years and the axiom always was that commercial is the highest and best use. If you had residential and it was converted, uh, they zoned it commercial, you were uh, dancing in the street. But now we're seeing uh, potential commercial sites being made into residential, which is, you know, it's an inversion that never existed in my career. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's a good thing right now because we need housing. And I, I just really like what they did with this site. Uh, yeah, so that part's really good. As far as house number one and the parking, I, I thought about a variance too, but I, you know, I'm a stickler for the requirements of a variance and I just can't see I'm trying to think of how we can justify and satisfy the state law requirements for a variance. The findings. The yeah. findings, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I was thinking too, this would be better off with just three parking spaces. It's too bad we require four. But, you know, there may, it, staff seems to think there's a solution to redesigning to solve the parking problem. And to me, that's, that's you know, I hope that that can be done. As far as the fourplex parking, I don't think 30 feet of driveway and an 80 foot frontage is is that uh, problematic in this setting. Um, you know, I look at the houses and other areas of Capitola and look at the size of the frontage and the size of the driveway, and it's really not out of out of line. So I'm okay with that. As far as the design style. Um, People differ in terms of their tastes. Uh, some people like that kind of style. Other people don't. I have to be one who does. Um, so the village, uh, if you look at the house next to the stairway on uh, El Camino, that's a similar kind of design style. And that's been there for how many years? And nobody has said, hey, that doesn't belong in a village. Um, we're an eclectic, uh, you know, it's a dynamic too. This is, I mean, the village is a living uh, entity, and it's it's not uh, 1924 forever. Uh, so maybe the character of the village is you know, can be more like a, a different kind of architecture. I can I can live with that. So all in all, 
Um, I think it's a great project, and the only problem I haven't been able to solve in my own mind is that one parking space. Um, <clears throat> yeah, <and> this, <clears throat> this is interesting because it becomes uh, very subjective, and um, especially, and this is kind of my issue with the next door concept is uh, we don't do this by popularity vote. Uh, to me, it's, I mean, we all have our own. I'm very, I very much believe that property owners have rights within the confines of codes, and, and we do have some guidelines, and, and I'm familiar with uh, Com Commissioner Roos' uh, work with the, uh, the Vision Capitola program, but um, I think he mentioned earlier we need to move into the 21st century, and I, I, I think we have to look at this, and, and I think um, the, your, your house or the fourplex, all of them could look, they, to me, they do look beachy. And so uh, it's, I guess it's how we look at those things. And I, I would leave that up to um, architects to articulate what homeowners want. And, and for me, I think it's, it's a great um, project. Looking at the parking issues, it's kind of interesting how we did this. So, um, you know, we're, we're saying on the fourplex, we want you to move it out to the street, but we're saying on the houses that we want you to have further, to be set further back to have room to park, right? So we kind of, we have this dichotomy. It's like, well, what are we trying to get to? And I, I have to go back to intent. And when <clears throat> we looked at um, this whole concept of moving um, structures closer to the street, really it was, in my mind, based around business, commercial, retail, trying to make that accessible and that's that would be the the frontage area and then we're doing trying to do the same thing on 41st Avenue but I don't think anybody would um, desire to have their home closer to the street if they had a choice it we'd rather sit that further back and um, so for me I think on the fourplex um, I, I understand what we were trying to get to and I see the layout and trying to how to make that work but I think how you've landscaped it, the two driveways are not concerning to me. Um, and if I look at really at the intent of why we were trying to move the projects out along the commercial uh, neighborhood areas was really more for retail in my mind, not necessarily for housing. Um, the driveway and, and house number one, I could I could name you house after house in Capitola. Some of those that I set on and some of these other commissioners set on uh, that we approved parking in these weird concepts. Uh, the very end of Central, we did one where it's just a, a piece of grass that we allowed to make a parking area. Um, it's uh, AstroTurf. Uh, we did it on recently on Riverview. We made another parking spot that because of the way the lot is. Um, we have many areas in Capitola where we don't have we're sidewalk exempt, Depot Hill sidewalk exempt. And I hate to use my own my own property, but using the theory that staff has, my driveway is 80 foot wide, well, 76 feet wide. So it wouldn't meet that intent. But when mine went through, I wasn't on the planning commission, obviously. Um, the area that's landscaped is in the, it, mostly in that um, setback area um, that is, well, part of the setback in part is the Capitola area, city owned area that we're required to landscape. I think if I'm thinking about it, not necessarily from a variance, but I think it meets the intent of what we want. Is there a buffer there between the roadway that hides and gives you some landscaping? Um, by your drawings and your architecture, to me, it meets that intent of trying to hide uh, the parking. So I, c I could live with that given the circumstances of, of that being a landscaped area on both um, the city right away, which by the way, you're required to landscape. You, you can't just leave it out there as gravel. They're, the city's not gonna allow us to do that. So to me, having that landscaped area, now we, I don't think we've deemed that area sidewalk exempt, have we, in that, that area? Like there aren't any sidewalks in that neighborhood. No, there are none, but I'm saying we haven't, are we asking them to put in sidewalks there? We are on Capitol, I know, but on that area, we're not asking them. So if we look at uh, Depot Hill, we look at the, um, the jewel box area, a lot of these areas we have identified as sidewalk exempt. If that's gonna be landscaped, to me, I think it meets the intent of what we're trying to do is not have cars parked right up against the, um, the roadway there. So uh, I'm flexible. I, I like to see the project go through um, one way or the other, whether we give a variance or whether we can see the intent of that landscaped area. 
Um, I'm flexible on any of those that we could do. So I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned that there was plenty of precedent for this, and, and I think that's, uh, that's where I got a different um, feeling from staff, that they time after time deny these kinds of things. And so if there is plenty of precedent, I think I'd like to explore those and the reasons for those exceptions, and maybe this would fit in to the same rationale. They probably weren't exceptions when they were built. Uh, well, I think if, the one on... If I may oh, clarify. Um, so typically when f folks come to the counter, we discourage them, but we've no, you know, they always have the option of coming to Planning Commission to ask uh, for that exception, and we inform them of that. But we discourage it because the, the, the code is at 20 feet. I did want to show you an image. Um, I'm hearing that you'd like to possibly accommodate this, and I think there's a, a good design solution. This is a property on Bay Avenue that was approved. It's near Gales a few years the back. Flag lot. It's the flag lot. The home in the front, and I'm not picking on the audience, because the no, owner I is here. Hey, Jerry. It was a great design solution that, um, you know, there were three or f I think three parking spaces required for this home. There's a garage in the middle, as you can see, and then there's the two, um, you know, where the tires tracks go in, it's paved. And then the, the um, parking, the site to the right, which you see this stepping where you're, um, it's lined up so that the tires would land on concrete, but it was really a minimalized parking solution in terms of they did not have the need for the parking and they wanted to decrease it to the extent possible. And I think something like this, especially with the modern design of the home, would fit in nicely in the front, but also um, address the Planning Commission's concerns about impacts of, and staff's concerns of too much So what are you parking. saying there? So possibly instead of a variance, having minimal concrete areas just for the are they des the same design, the same site plan that they have already, or has it changed? I'm sorry. This is, um, I was suggesting for possibly where the one space is in the front to take a similar design approach. Dirt blocks? Yeah, and just where the tires go rather than having all concrete. How in the does front. that change the issue? It doesn't, but it's more, it w you wouldn't uh, be considering a variance, but. Um, can I can I ask real quick? Makes it look less like a driveway. Makes it look less like a driveway in a front yard. I, I didn't do the math, but um, under our new code, currently we include the garage space as part of the floor area ratio. Would that change that on this and change the parking requirement under the new code? I didn't I didn't do the math. Usually I would look at that and I guess. Yes. So would we be below that threshold of not needing? If we, if we didn't count the ADU and we didn't count the garage, then. It would be under the 2600. And three spaces would be required. Yep. Right. But the ADU doesn't count, right? It already doesn't count. Yeah. Right. It doesn't require any additional parking. Right. So what's the total square footage with the excluding the ADU? 26 something. 2708. And the so maximum the for three spaces is 2600? Yeah. So if we deduct the garage under a new code, they wouldn't, it, under the new code, they're not going to need that additional parking spot. Right. So we can't do a variance without having uh, advertised for a variance, first of all. No. Mm -hmm. So that's out. They haven't even made an application for a variance. Right. <laughs> so the, but the notion of invoking the new code. No, I, I'm not asking, I'm it. not asking to invoke the new code. I'm just saying, is there some leniency to move towards these exceptions like we've done in these other areas to have that area looking landscape, whether it's turf blocks or whatever, um, and adding some leniency, knowing that well, yeah, we, we move. Cause I, I keep going back to intent. We we keep going back to uh, the new code. We did that specifically because it's not fair, really, to ask people. And I understand. I'm not asking us to adopt the new code on this one project, but we did that because it's unfair for ask for parking spots for parking spots we require. So we require this covered park parking garage. And that increases the parking demand yep. for the property. It makes absolutely no sense. So here we have an opportunity to make an exception to what that parking spot looks like. And it, 
um, to me, I think it's kind of um, not fair to say it's really a, what do we say, 43 foot wide driveway because it has a landscaped area, a buffer in between it, but that's me. For me, I don't have a problem getting to, to that. I don't even like that space because I don't think you can get to it if the other spaces are occupied. It's like a tandem space, actually. It is, but we allow tandem spaces, right? So, so, so uh, I'm intrigued with this idea of the of using the anticipated new code to allow a fair. <laughs> I, I don't want to go oh, there. I didn't want to that. say that. <laughs> what I'm trying to say, I'm not. I'm not trying to say they're using the new code. I'm trying to go back to intent. We we changed the code because it's not fair to ask the no, occupant. No, I get it, but I'm just what I'm trying to say. I, I'm trying to think of who, you know, neighbors objecting, you know, where we, you know, this is well, a yeah, violation of what all we've been standing for for years and years. But if, in fact, we've actually gone through all that via the new code and, and, and we've had our public outreaches and all this stuff, and we now have this new code that we're trying to implement, <clears throat> and all we're doing here is just saying, you know, we don't need to go out for public outreach again for all this or try to get, we are, it's already been done. And if we just use that new code rationale, we will, can we not violate anything uh, in the current I? code, does it? So yeah. I, I think if, if you were to move forward with this application and not want to have the parking space in the front yard, I would suggest I, we cannot apply the new code. It does not. No, no I'm not it, asking. I, I didn't so, mean, I'm trying but, to go back to But intent. you could, you could re, we could re-notice it for the next hearing, and we've done this in the past to support a variance. If I don't if, think we can make the findings of so, a variance. But, and then your other option is to allow it to be designed differently. But another, yeah, another would, point is that uh, it hasn't come up is that this particular street, I mean, in terms of capital and, and traffic and congestion is, is on the low, very low end. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and so, you know, maybe it's not really that much of a precedent because you really don't have any, maybe in Cliffwood Heights, but, you know, it, it's just not impacted. Yeah, for me, I don't, it's not a hard reach to find an exception to allow that to be, I would, I would still, encourage that to that to be a landscaped parking area so we're not just giving up a parking spot because i think that would not be fair but um i was trying to use the logic of how we got to the i, I shouldn't have brought up the new code but how we got there it's really kind of an unfair process so for me it's it's a i can i can make that exception for that parking spot being a landscape parking spot if, if five feet of the public right of way becomes part of the landscaped area does that eliminate an on-street parking spot does not the width is it doesn't eliminate a parking spot so i think i'm gonna make motion good do we have to, do we have to take all three of these in one lump motion? yes all yes yeah yes. it's uh, all go or no go here and i'm gonna move uh, that we approve uh, the application with the findings uh, for approval that were prepared by the staff okay do we with have the one? public works uh, additional public works com, uh, conditions as yes. well. Yes. Yes. Do we have a second? I'm not sure I understand the uh, uh, the motion. You're you're just you moved the staff's recommendation. No, no, no. The staff uh, recommended uh, that we send it back for redesign. I'm moving that we, they they also provided alternative findings if we don't agree. So I'm moving approval. Are you going to add the condition for turf blocks in that other parking space? Uh, Yes, I'll accept that. I'll second for discussion. Okay, uh, I guess we're up for discussion now. So I'm curious as to ra your rationale, because uh, it violates the driveway requirement. And you're saying we're going to allow a exception, an exception, not a variance, exception because because of the, it's a low traffic area one factor is the low traffic area because there's the the landscaped area and you you you're gonna, the, the berm basically is the dis yeah the design kind of uh, take minimizes the uh, negatives of that uh, uh, undesired type of parking and, and that the, the additional space will be uh, Turf blocks is that is that right? It'll be it'll additional be, parking spot would be almost a phantom parking space. 
because it, you know, it's not going to look so much like a parking space, and it's really not that usable a lot of the time anyway. And is that uh, and and. Uh, and I'm, now I want to go back to what uh, TJ said, is that don't, we... Don't we, mention the new code. <laughs> no, I'm not going to mention the new code, but you said this time I won't mention the new code. I don't know why that's so taboo, but <laughs> I'm violating something or other. But the, the, the notion you said, we've done this before. Yes. And, and using... Well, you just saw one example on the screen. Where well, I didn't quite understand, understand that one either, but... Uh, but using similar rationale... Uh, I just, I just don't want to set precedent No, I, I agree. And so I could give you a couple examples. Have you been to my house? I have seen your house, yes. I've okay. by it many times. Okay. So my house, under their definition, my house wouldn't pass. Even though I have that large landscaped area between the two driveways, I have a circular driveway, and the property line is two feet off of my driveway. So most of that is in the city right-of-way. And what so was the rationale for you getting your uh, approval? Nobody asked. They just approved it. So, and Mick, Mick may have been, been on that one. I don't know. So another one would be at the very end of Central on the left-hand side, the gray house that had a lot of controversy. That driveway, there's a parking spot in the front yard that's made out of turf block grass. Um, what, what did I say? There was another one. Riverview, I was saying one. Oh, Riverview, we did one because of the shape of the lot. Off to the left of the driveway, we made a same thing. It's just a turf type parking area so it's it's not that we I, I don't know that I want to always make exceptions for this but if I look at it it has a landscaped area um, really we've defined I don't want to say the new code we're asking them to put a parking spot there for garage space which uh, it wouldn't need this parking spot without that there so for me it was easy to get get to that point where I could make that exception Another factor is that it's really close to the three tire requirement. I mean, very. Oh, yeah. close yeah. to what? It, it, it's very. It's just a little bit over the three tire requirement in size. Without the garage calculation, it wouldn't need the three car. I actually checked the code on that. It's uh, the flurry for the uh, attached ADU does actually count towards the parking requirement. Because it's only the size internal of ADUs that don't count towards oh. parking requirement. Uh, so attached ADU would generally require another space. This one didn't have to do that because it's within half a mile of a transit stop. So, so that was how this one was required to not have parking, but it does not get subtracted from the parking okay. requirement, just to clarify that. Let me ask you a silly question. Mm -hmm. Would it be permissible to landscape your front yard with turf blocks? As long as there's enough <laughs> permeable. <laughs> You're going to submit that kind of landscape well, it plan? It could be considered landscaping if it uses turf blocks. Right. So Do you want to talk about the new code or the old <laughs> <Yeah>. code? <now? laughs> I think we're, cl I think, but, but I think right we're now, close. Yeah. So we have a first and a second. So I, uh, before we vote, I, I'd like to explore this turf block thing a little bit. Uh, do we want to be that specific? Is the idea that uh, you, you want to have it a permeable surface? or what? I'm not sure what even turf blocks are. You're just talking about little patches of grass. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we, we it, keyed, keyed off of the uh, photo that we the saw. Bay the Bay Avenue area. thing. Um, do we they, want us? They've already identified it was going to be permeable, uh, so well, but we could leave that up to staff to help them figure that out. I don't. You may want to um, have the condition that it's um, the impact is decreased through a design, just so that if I'm not sure if turf block is exactly what they'll yeah. want to use or concrete stand, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to leave a little bit of flexibility in there, but that to the right. to minimize the impact of the design to the extent possible. That, uh, if it's okay with Mission Ruth, that we just that they design that uh, fourth parking space so that it minimizes the parking space impact per uh, staff approval. I second that amendment. Okay. Okay. Then I'm going to call for a roll call vote. Then Is there any way vote. we can break these out and vote on them individually? Uh, no. Because of the storm water, it doesn't allow. Okay. It. Okay, Commissioner Ruth. Well, even though I support the two homes, uh, I have to vote no because I. I don't think the design on the apartment building is acceptable. Okay. Commissioner Newman? Yes. Commissioner Wilk? Yes. Chair Welch? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so it passes, and uh, good luck. Thank you. When's construction start? Soon. <laughs> <laughs>
Got 10 days. Okay, so very good. We're on to the director's report. Okay. Congratulations. There's no director's report this evening. The big announcement is the Sears open house. Great. And, and I have that on my Seventh. commissioner communication. Anything, commissioner comments? Nothing for me. No, I, I want to remind the commissioners that the, this uh, mall redevelopment never would have happened if we had approved the Sears repurposing. Ouch. Ouch. That, <laughs> that was that was directed to me, I think. But that's okay. No, sorry. That's okay. But I, no, I think I, uh, we did the right thing and uh, it pushed it in the right direction. Well, I'm happy. And I've learned a few things from you um, through this couple of years sitting with you. So it's all good. So <laughs> June 11th at, at 6 p.m. at the Sears building, there will be a... Uh, not a presentation, but some discussions about the uh, the new mall with Merlin Geyer for those that want to attend. And with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>